All right, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Again, again, you want to be civil. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If, if those of you would, wouldn't mind, remain, if you are able to remain standing, I'd like to take a brief moment of silence um, just in, um, in memory of our retired uh, health department director, Martin Fair, who we lost this morning. You could just take a brief moment to reflect. Thank you. Our first order of business is to recognize. I think uh, we may want to hold off on that. Our I believe we're going to need to reschedule the recognition for Mr. Weiss. Um, so either at, uh, I know there will be a recognition by the Conservation Commission at an upcoming Conservation Commission meeting. If um, um, all right. We if may want to see. If arrive, <laughs> our, <laughs> our first order of business is just to skip over the first order of business, and we will hold off on that. We were planning to recognize Martin Weiss, but we'll wait on uh, that. You just mentioned that Mr. Weiss has been a 27-year member of the uh, Conservation Commission and is stepping down at the end of October, and uh, not very many people served 27 years here, and he's done a great job. But we'll recognize him when he can make it. All right. Next order of business. Minutes. Are the minutes. Madam Chair, I move to approve the July 15, 2019 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All in favor, one absent. Oh. Madam Chair, I move to approve the July 15, 2019 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion and a second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All in favor, one absent. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to approve the August 19, 2019 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Four in favor, one absent. And Madam Chair, I move to approve the August 19, 2019 executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Four in favor, one absent. Madam Chair, I move to approve the September 9, 2019 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam Aye. Chair, I move to September 9. I move to approve the September 9, 2019 executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, four in favor, one absent. And that's it for minutes. All right. We're on to board, board member reports. Mr. O'Leary? Um, again, water, wastewater. Uh, we met again this today, and we're uh, scheduled again for October 16th. Things are moving forward in relation to uh, our discussions with the town of Andover and the siting of our uh, chlorination plant. So we hope to have a finalization for the board to act on shortly in relation to the uh, chlorination plant. We have a location that we think will work, but uh, still subject to negotiation uh, with the parties. Uh, again, I, I just want to uh, reiterate the, uh, the sadness in the passing of uh, you know, Martin Fair. I mean, Martin served the, served the town for, uh, I don't know how long, 20 years? How long was Martin here? Uh, 30 years or 30 more. 30 years or more. 30 years or more. 
you know, as a health agent, a uh, familiar figure to a lot of people in the community, uh, certainly familiar to the members of the board here uh, over the years, and uh, I'm just saddened by the thought that, uh, you know, after he retired about three years ago, uh, had an illness and wasn't able to enjoy his retirement. So, uh, a terrific public servant. Uh, uh, low key is an understatement. When it came to Marty's uh, presentations uh, before this board, it was like, all right, Marty, come on. You know, but uh, terrific guy, knew his stuff, uh, very knowledgeable. Um, his expertise and uh, his contributions to the community um, being enjoyed to this day. And again, and, uh, to his family, you know, our condolences. Thank you. Mr. Waller? Okay, um, I had a chance to uh, uh, join the Council of Aging uh, board meeting during the month. Um, uh, on the, the highest agenda is uh, getting the letter signed uh, saying that we endorse the AARP um, uh, Aging Well Initiative. And then the, and I think that's going to be on your docket to sign because I think you have to be the one who signs. So we're looking forward to having that happen. And then continuing that is coming up with the resources that's going to be needed to pull that, that project off. It's a three to five year commitment, um, and it's going to take some resources. So I, I help them think about how to strategize in doing that, um, what might be palatable to the board and to the town. Uh, so I know they're in process of working on that. So uh, that's a good thing that's happening there. Um, I also had a chance to go to the CPC session uh, in the middle of the month, September, and that was to get final comment on the 10-year uh, strategic plan, the 2018-2028 uh, CPC strategic plan. Um, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, a few graphics are just holding up the final publication of that. But the most important thing is, um, Having direct involvement with that, Daniel McKnight, our town planner sitting here, also had major amounts. And also the residents of North Reading have had significant amounts of contribution to it. And the, um, the results are, 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 are worthy of sharing with the town in some public forum. And so I know that's a discussion point um, because, because the worst thing could happen is if we have a nice report and never gets uh, shared back with the town that we don't take any action and put it into place. Um, and I'll just say the five things that came through as the most important, and they, there's a lot of subsets to this, but the five things is protecting and celebrating our natural areas, um, improving and expanding its walking and biking trail system, improving the aesthetics of the built environment, strengthening the town's community and economic development, and leaving a legacy for future generations. There's a lot of you know, substance inside there. Those are the five main things. And that was driven by CPC, by community involvement over the last six, seven years, and by surveys that they've done. So again, the biggest thing is, how do we get all the boards to learn about it? How do we get all the boards to be on page, understand what's supposed to be achieved, and actually work towards achieving the goals that they've set up? Um, you will talk about C C EDC? You're gonna talk about EDC and what they're doing? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I was delighted. Thank you for sending me the information about what happened in Linfield concerning bikes and trails and how what was a very contentious um, uh, vote in that town for the last 10 years, they, like I think it was 70% voted in favor of um, uh, coming up with seed money to get the project going and they're going to be having a, a great bike trail going from Wakefield into Lin Linfield and connect a lot of things up that hopefully in the future we will find our way to the same thing. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mr. Schultz? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, it was brought to my attention on social media that um, there were some repairs needed at the kid spot, the playground, for safety concerns some parents had. Uh, Parks and Rec have made those repairs today, and they've asked me to let the public know in the future if there's an issue at any of the parks, please just call them directly and let them know, and they will address the problem right away. As Mr. Walner stated, EDC, we have an economic development forum that's going to be coming in October. Uh, we're still working out the final agenda for that. However, it's going to be, uh, basically, it's going to be, we want to listen to the businesses. How can we help you? That's going to be the main push at this forum. And just a quick update on the SSBC litigation. Uh, we did have a mediation on the case. Uh, it did not resolve, and we continue to go forward in the litigation process. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, and just to get back to you, Mr. Waller, that Mrs. Pecora actually mentioned that to me. I saw her in person mention that application. It was resoundingly, unanimously approved by the board to support that application. I that so right. she, I think the finalized version of it came to, she sent that, and that's under review. And I know the board is, is in full support, but it just, I think it just made its way to us. And that might have had something to do with a bit of the signing delay, but. Okay, Mr. Gilberto. And, and there was a delay on my part, which I apologize to Ms. Manzelli for as well. I believe you do have the letter there to, to be signed. But thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate Ms. Bacora coming forward. And the second thing I wanted to do was, and this is a little bit unusual, but uh, amusement machines and billiards don't really generate a whole heck of a lot of interest. And I want to thank the citizens who have reached out to me personally in person or over the telephone to thank us because that generated a lot of input by residents of the town a number of people were here so those meetings extended into the late hours of the evening and i appreciate that appreciate people appreciate the work that that we do as a board and trying to hear everybody on those types of matters so i wanted to let my my colleagues know that um, that, that people had reached out, and I thank, I thank people for doing that. So I think we can move along to public comment. I just have one other thing. Sure. Since our last meeting, I, uh, once in a while we have responsibilities as a member of the board to, to step up, I guess. And, and I was asked to judge the uh, apple pie contest at the Apple Festival. <laughs> and it was uh, Tough one of the more difficult uh, decisions <laughs> I've had to make in, in rating. Uh, you know the the, the, uh, the apple pies, and the, uh, I only had to taste six or seven pieces of pie, so it was a difficult thing to, to do, but a difficult decision to make. But uh, the festival was a wonderful uh, opportunity for the community to come together. The pies were terrific. The decision was difficult, and uh, Mark was also uh, one of the uh, one of the judges, and I think he'll vouch for the fact that somebody had to do it. Somebody <laughs> had to, <laughs> you know. But uh, but it was a great event, and. Uh, Congratulate uh, the, the sponsor of the event, Historical Antiquarium Society, and all the people who uh, put it all together. And uh, very busy. And Their exhibits great, are it, great. It, it was a great day. Yeah, yeah, it was a great day. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to move along to public comment. Is anyone here to speak in public comment? Seeing none, we'll move it along to the um, warrant article informational hearing, which is our next. Agenda item set for seven thirty. Mr. Gilbert, <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. You're all set. It's a very thin warrant, but don't let that fool you. There's some gems in here. So please, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as usual, I've prepared a PowerPoint presentation in the interest of the audience and those at home to better understand the warrant articles that are, are scheduled to be taken up at town meeting. This is just a quick summary that shows you um, the available funds. For purposes of this discussion, the most important number is the one that is not certified by the Department of Revenue yet, um, and that's our free cash number. I have been in contact with the finance director who um, has been uh, in touch with uh, the, the Department of Revenue, and we do not have any reason to believe that the number will not be certified before the October town meeting, which is one week from tonight. So we're expecting certification to occur this week. Uh, and I've also uh, been assured that uh, while we don't have a final number, there will be more than sufficient funds to allow us to take the financial actions um, that are contemplated on the warrant and in this presentation. So moving forward, I'll go through the articles uh, one by one as I normally do. The first is to hear and act on reports of town officers and committees. Um, I have not heard of any that are seeking to um, make a report at the, uh, at the town meeting, although I, I think it's possible that the Economic Development Committee may wish to speak to the, um, the activities that they've been planning for later in the month um, at, uh, at town meeting. Uh, but uh, they have not made a formal request at this point. Moving on to Article 2, prior year bills. Um, we, until uh, today, we had kind of resolved all of the bills that were out there with some open purchase orders, but we did identify the one potential DPW bill, which is under $2,000, and 
amount um, today. Um, so we'll continue to see if that's one that does require authorization at town meeting to be paid or not. Um, it's, uh, so we're still doing some research on that bill as it was just identified today. Moving through to Article 3, transferring funds to our Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund, the funds used for capital purchases and debt service. The balance is $885,000, and the article proposes to add $200,000 from free cash per our fiscal year 2020 capital plan, which would bring the balance um, to uh, just uh, over $1 million. And the funding source, again, would be free cash for that. We then would uh, utilize that for our capital plan to be recommended to the June town meeting and for other purposes. Other related purposes, I should say. Appropriating money to the stabilization fund, I think as folks may remember, we did transfer in $500,000 um, during the course of last fiscal year. Uh, we are not recommending a transfer into the fund uh, at this October town meeting. Um, I have spoken with the Finance Committee, and I believe that they are in support of not transferring fund in, uh, funding in at the October Town Meeting, but that they may wish to make some comments and perhaps a recommendation for the June Town Meeting. Article 5, transferring funds to other post-employment benefits liability trust fund. We did make a transfer in June in accordance with our annual revenue and expense plan and therefore are not recommending a transfer into this fund at the October town meeting. Article 6 appropriates money to the participating funding arrangement fund. This is a fund that's a reserve account to pay for the town's portion of future employee health insurance costs, so it's different than the OPEB fund, which covers uh, retired employees' costs. The recommended transfer is $301,000 from free cash, which reflects the town's portion of remaining, fund, remaining funds from the fiscal year 2020 employee health insurance program. So um, this, is, uh, this is nearly a final number. Um, it takes about 48 hours for them to generate the, uh, the final number, but um, uh, we believe on Wednesday that that's, this number will be confirmed. This is again another indicator of the strong performance of our participating funding arrangement fund. Um, uh, something that we put together two fiscal years ago with our employees through the Insurance Advisory Committee. Um, we made some adjustments going into this past fiscal year which just ended um, on which this dollar amount is um, um, based and I'm just catching that I've called it the fiscal year 2020 employee health insurance program, but it's actually the fiscal year 2019 program, the year that just ended. Another strong year, um, despite the reduction and in some indications that claims might have been higher than we were projecting, um, the fund actually covered pretty well, so um, we're just a few thousand dollars shy of what the projected target was here, which again is another uh, good place for us to be in terms of our, of our health insurance costs. There is an employee portion tied to this, um, this arrangement that is reserved separately through the treasurer's office that's not part of this. This is only the town share of the premium. Moving on to Article 7, the fiscal year 2020 operating budget. At their last meeting, the board had had a discussion relative to um, funding that may be required relative to the 20 Elm Street project. Um, and any potential appeals or other related um, actions. This, uh, I have consulted with town council and after consulting with them and after reviewing um, the performance of the town council budget over the past couple of years, my recommendation would be a transfer of $125,000 from free cash to line seven town council expenses. And that we believe would be sufficient uh, to handle uh, the procedure process through June 30th of 2020, which is the end of the fiscal year. That would include legal expenses as well as any potential um, consultant expenses as well. So it, it is in this article that we would also need to seek transfer or um, for, for purposes of the the um, school litigation too. Uh, we do have a separate article for that that will come up in a, in a few a few articles okay. later. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Uh, just, just that it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the board felt it was important that uh, you know, we have enough resources. Again, this isn't an unforeseen uh, situation anymore. <coughs> so uh, obviously, we're going to be. 
uh, in for a little bit of a differences of opinion which need to be litigated over the next uh, several months. And I think it's uh, a strong statement that uh, if we're willing to defend the town's position on the 40B and uh, put the requisite resources in place to uh, hire the appropriate consultants and uh, legal fees in order to uh, put forth the town's defense in relation to the application that's before us. Comments, questions? All set? Yeah. Okay. Moving along to Article 8, which would be to rescind pre previous authorizations to borrow. Uh, there are no bonds that are recommended to be rescinded at this time, so the motion will be to pass over the article. Article 9 would appropriate money for special counsel legal expenses. Um, it would provide for additional funding for legal expenses related to the secondary school building project. The article would propose to appropriate $250,000 in free cash for continued legal action to bring the case through trial based on the current schedule and projections. Um, the town has previously authorized $1,140,000 to date and approximately $220,700 of that remains unexpended. So that would leave us on hand with $470,700. Any questions? Just trying to do the math here. So if you add the extra money onto the 1.1? Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you. Um, so this, this is a separate line item? Is this in a separate line item than the you know the the town council budget that, that's okay. correct all right anyone else and have any questions about that i do have a couple of slides that give a, a bit of background going yeah, back to the approval process in 2012 and 2013 our pursuit of legal avenues available to the town to hold the architect and the project manager accountable for the unanticipated increased cost of the project um, as I think folks probably know, litigation strat strategy and substantive updates are purely an executive se session issue, and it would prejudice the town's interest to discuss these issues uh, at any open meeting, including town meeting. But with regard to this matter, we did file actions against PMA consultants and Doran Whittier in the fall of 2015. Funds would serve to continue these legal actions. And there's no questions, I'll go to Article 10. Madam Chair? <laughs> well, I just think, and, and to add a little bit of that without getting into the finer points, I think procedurally cases take on a life of their own which prolongs the agony, I guess you could say, or prolongs the litigation. So is, uh, although it might seem to be something that's languishing, there, there, have, been, there have procedurally been things going on with the case since it's since it's filing really so that's correct so in addition there's been counterclaims filed against the town yes. which we have to defend ourselves that's to that's right yeah so those were that was uh, basically unanticipated and uh, leading to you know driving some of the budget budget increases that are going on here so okay. moving on to article 10 appropriating funds for a survey um, engineering design and or construction of a portion of the Swamp Pond Road. Just for a little bit of history, June 2018 town meeting funded a $10,000 feasibility study for paving a portion of the gravel portion of the road. Uh, all but one property owner owning two parcels have signed off for um, in concept for the project. Uh, we talked to the board back in May of this year and the board was okay with us proceeding with the study which was done. I think we reviewed the study at the last meeting and we also reviewed um, the, the results of the study uh, at a September 23rd meeting with the neighborhood here in this room. We have some uh, good attendance, some, folk, some of the folks are here this evening um, as well. Um, the estimated cost for the project to bring it to, to fruition was um, identified to be $315,000. Based on our internal discussion, I think our recommendation was going to be that the appropriation for the project would be $350,000 in order to address any con contingencies. Um, we presented this to the uh, to the neighborhood, and, and we did look for some feedback. And I, I certainly there are some of the neighbors that are here, and the DBW is represented as well. But to, to try to summarize it, um, 
that I, I think that there's quite a bit of interest in doing the project in the neighborhood. Um, there is one area that's unfortunately towards the middle of the stretch of road that we're talking about where we do not have and do not believe that we are likely to obtain permission to pave. So that would result in an interruption in, in, in the project in terms of the, the paving. Um, unfortunately, the two parcels that, that are in question have not signed off the way they're geographically located. Um, they really make it not feasible for us to pave on a third parcel adjacent to them because of the topography. We really would need to drain that third parcel onto one of the two other parcels. And I'm not going to name the individuals involved, and I think that the discussion has been a healthy and res respectful one. But um, it just poses some, some challenge with regard to it, um, as well as what I've described before, which is that this project is not being contemplated under a traditional betterment bylaw because it's we're not following the, tra tra the, the traditional street acceptance, acceptance process. So what that means is the avenue of doing a betterment being, being paid back to the town over a series of years, perhaps as long as 20 years, is not readily available to us for this project, which would mean if there was a portion being um, paid for by the abutting property owners, they would in all likelihood have to come up with the, the, fundings, uh, the funding up front for their share, um, if this were going to be funded in that fashion. Um, so I'll look to the DPW director and the town engineer to see if I, if I miss anything from a, kind of the high points of it that you want to add um, to it, and if not, then Mr. O'Leary. Just a, Turn a to question. At the last meeting, uh, I thought we asked to, uh, what would we need to do in order to determine uh, the range was 25 to 50 percent of the portion up here of this town or land. Um, what do we need to do in order to get a better idea to quantify exactly, you know, what portion does the town own anyway? And then that certainly would have an impact on overall cost to the residents out there. Right. So you call... Uh, Mr. Powers. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Thank I'm you sorry for... Sorry, everyone knows thank who you, you are. For, uh, People listening me. at home know who's telling us this simple. Well, good evening, Madam Chair. Thank <laughs> good you. Evening. So you recall at the last meeting, I, I, I spoke about how all of our plans and all of our information that we've worked with so far is based on the GIS system here, which is um, not survey accurate um, information by, by any, by any uh, determination. So what we need to do in order to figure out what the town's um, apportionment of this or what the town's obligations would be financially to this would be to have a formal survey done of the area. Uh, it's a large area, you know, a number of different properties, several different properties, so it's a rather large undertaking. Um, but I think it would be important to have that done if we are going to advance the project because, A, we'd understand what our financial obligation is, what our share of the cost of the project would be, and also because when we're done this, I spoke about at the last meeting about how we were going to have uh, a variety of drainage facilities and different things that would end up off of the roadway and on properties. And without that property line survey, without understanding where the properties um, lie, those facilities um, will be in sort of no man's land. So we're, we're, going to want, uh, we're going to want to understand where those facilities will end up so that we can determine whose responsibility they are. If they ultimately end up being the town's responsibility, we're going to need to create easements and things so that we can we can uh, maintain those facilities. So I think that's one of the one, it would be one important next step. So, yeah, so what's the estimated cost of the survey? What do we need? So my my personal estimate was you know this is a rather large undertaking. I could see it costing upwards of forty thousand dollars, potentially more. I haven't looked at any <laughs> deeds. I haven't done any research into what the property lines look like out there. I know there have been some surveys done, but if they get into a situation where there are some tracts of lands that need to be reconciled, it's a large area, it could, it could, it could get up into that area. It could be less expensive than that. I really, I'm not sure. The estimate we got for survey uh, did not account for full property line survey. What they, what they were providing was topographic survey, uh, location of buildings, those type of things, things that we could, that would allow us to get through the permitting process. So we would flag and locate all of the wetlands, that would help us understand what the, where the buffer zones were, locate the houses, where the roadway uh, exists, so those type of things. But the full property line survey was not included in that original, um, in that original estimate. Mr. Schultz. Oh, Mr. O'Leary, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Follow. Some of these properties that are town owned, were those subject to when we originally took them for uh, reservoir purposes, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of time. 
one is. One is. Uh, so we yeah, at least have, one. So we so at least one. So I mean, so we should have uh, some starting points there as to the land that was taken. Right. And uh, by the town with the meets and bounds to, to work from, which right. would reduce the cost of the survey, I would yeah. assume. Yeah, and there, yeah, there are other things you can do. If you, you know, we can work with the surveyor, whoever that may be, and just, you know, make it project specific. We need to understand where the property lines are specific to where the facilities may be or where the roadway may be. We don't need a, a, a property corner way out, you know, way past the limits of the project. We need to keep it focused on the project. So that, that would help reduce the cost. Okay. So... Just to, to me, you know, we need to get this quantified so that people can make an informed decision. This board, as well as town meeting, as well as the, the individuals who are going to be impacted up here uh, financially. So, you know, I don't know, 40,000, that's an outside number? Or? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's just my, my opinion, you know, and it's, I haven't been able to do any deed research or anything like that, but... Um, it's a rather large area, several different properties. If you have to reconcile a few property lines, like not to mention the amount of time out in the field it would take to locate monumentation and all of those other things that it, you know, the things they take back to the office in order to make the determination on the various property lines, it can be time consuming. So that's just my, from my experience. But Mr. Schultz, it, Mr. Brown, I'm just concerned. How do um, the logistics of this, and we've passed over this article, I think, a few times now, which I don't, and I see we're going to probably, my guess is passing over it again, because I don't know how we can appropriate $350,000 without any agreement amongst the residents and any agreement regarding the cost sharing. That, to me, that needs to be done before you appropriate the money. Right, so I think that's what we're talking about. We, we spent some time at the meeting talking about that and how, how we would determine what the shares would be. So if we did, if we did follow... Uh, the betterment procedure, which is you know basically what we have to go by, and we did a, a per foot basis. We really don't have a really hard number on that. That's not to say we couldn't come to some other under understanding with, you know, the, the larger group. But you know, if we use the bylaw as the framework, we would go on a on a curb foot basis, and we really don't know what that is because we don't have anything formal. We don't have a property line or really where the road is, um, you know, in and reality. And the other issue is without unlike a betterment. This is like a cost-sharing arrangement more than a, than a betterment. Betterment town can put it through and assess it. Here, everybody has to agree or we can't do this. We have That's that right. one holdout in the middle. I don't know how you do this project with that one holdout in the middle. Right. To me, that's got to hold this thing up. And, and every owner on that street's got to agree. Whatever the cost is, they got to be able to come up with that money and agree on how we're going to pay it back. Right. And, until that's all done, I don't know how we go forward on this article. But it's difficult because we don't. We know that the town has a considerable amount of frontage on the roadway, 25 percent plus potentially, but we don't know for sure. So that number, you know, for someone who's really close to to buying in, uh, it may help their argument, or it may help them decide that they don't want to do the project if they understand exactly what the town's portion will be and therefore what their portion will be. So I guess my question is, for purposes of town meeting next week. What are we asking the town? We're not asking for 350 because we, we don't know. What are we logistically trying to do next week to move this thing forward, I guess? Oh, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, no, I mean, I would suggest, you know, let's get the meets and bounds here on the, on the roadway, or the, whatever you want to call it, yeah. on the roadway so that we can determine exactly, yeah. you know, what the, what the town's portion is. And then, then we can move forward and make an informed decision. You know, you know we're not going to go ahead and appropriate $350,000. Right. Yes. So to me, you know, let's into the residents appropriate the thirty-five or forty thousand dollars to get the survey done, and then we'll have a, a better idea to make a, a better informed decision. And to the residents, everybody has to agree, or this, this is going to fail. I don't know how you get around that, and this if it's a cost-sharing arrangement. I mean, it's just the nature of what it is. I just had a quick question, if, if, Ms. Paul. Do you have any questions, Mr. Waller? No. I just have a. Can't, you can't pave then stop the pavement and then resume the payment over or not crossing over that parcel right it's not an ideal situation no i don't i don't know that you would get a lot of engineers that would agree that that's you know from a functional standpoint that that's ideal it's not to say that it can't be done but you can understand you know when we're we're in plowing every winter you don't know where that pavement starts and stops when there's you know six inches of snow on the ground so we'll be continually picking away at the edges of that that gap so it's not ideal um, that's not to say that it's impossible but it, it's my understanding that 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 we're already paving 
right? Is all of that paved all the way? No, no. No, but we are maintaining it. We are, we are obligated to maintain that. So we're filling holes and regrading when the water washes the roadway out. And, you know, I think. So filling holes with just dirt? Yes, it, with gravel. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's all dirt, in other words. It's a recycled asphalt product. So yeah, it's, it's, it's gravel. Right. It, I mean, up in this neighborhood already, we have a situation where this part of it's paved and then it goes to the hard pack. So we're already plowing, we're already maintaining yeah. it. And so can it be done? Yes. Is it ideal? No. Right. Would we like to get everybody to buy it? Yes. Uh, should they? I don't know why they wouldn't, but you know, yeah. we're dealing with the, with the personality. And the problem is, like, do you guys that live there, if, if groups of people don't buy in, I don't know how we do this project. We can't have like pavement, dirt, pavement, dirt, pavement, yeah, I, dirt. I think what it is is we have, yeah. a, we have a situation right now where the whole thing is a, we can't quantify it quite yet. We have a final cost, but as to what is it going to be assessed up there to the residents up there uh, who already pay substantial amount of taxes anyway. Um, but to, to your point, we're, we're already doing it up there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're already, we already have hot top and some areas going up there and then it goes to, it, it's very hard packed. I mean, in the report, mm -hmm. the engineer's report stated it's pretty mm -hmm. much impervious now anyway. Right. Uh, uh, well, the reason I asked that was because if, if it's already there and we're already covering it, then to have to go through, is the next step, the survey, the result of your already doing the feasibility study to say that we need that now? Because we already have, we know the path, so to speak. Right. We know what, you know, I thought the feasibility study was to figure out runoff and how to attend to those environmental issues, not where the boundaries are, because I would assume we're just gonna work on what's in existence there. So why go through all of this extra effort of surveys, which there may, they may, the residents may already have some of that, right. you know, possibly, it's not typical, but possibly yeah. um, from their private, private records. But why go through that if you know where the road's gonna be placed? Yeah, so really it comes down to cost sharing. We don't know, um, we don't know what the town share are, or, and therefore what any of the, the residents share of the, the, the cost of the roadway improvements will be until we determine you know, what length of roadway is on each person's property. So if you decide that we're not going to do that on a per foot basis, that we're going to do just the cost sharing, everybody has an equal share, um, I'm not sure that Lily can do that, that's a question for somebody else, but then we have the problem of where these drainage facilities lie. If we don't know whose property on them, whose properties they are on, we can't have an easement on them. It's impossible for us to, dr to draft an easement on a property we, that we don't know the limits to. Uh, so it, it, there's some difficulty in that as well. So there's two things, is the cost sharing, and then the final product is gonna have drainage facilities associated with that someone has to have ownership of. If a homeowner doesn't have ownership of it, then we're gonna be responsible for maintaining those, and DEP is gonna require that we have someone named who's responsible for those facilities. If it's gonna be the town, then we need to have easements in order to access those, and the, yeah. uh, they're likely to ask to make sure that we have that access. How so that they are properly How many of those maintained. are you expecting based on the feasibility study? I'm sorry, how many? How many, how many? Um, of those facilities? Yes. The drainage facilities, yes. there was a half a dozen, I think, throughout the, throughout the project. Okay, so that only impacts possibly six parcels. Right. So you're not talking about each and every homeowner having to do a, uh, an end No, it's really, it's really based on the topography. So Just they're no. obviously, they're, they're in the lowest points typically. And since you attended that meeting with the residents, what, what was their vote in terms of what they wanted to do? Did they want to equally share it? Did they want to divide it up based upon square footage of, you know, parcel there ownership? Was, there was no formal vote on how they would go about it. I think there was, there was discussions on how, how they would do both. I think, I think some residents didn't want other residents to have a disproportionate share of the cost of that, but we didn't, we didn't land on anything formally. Um, so there was really no formal vote on, you know, how it would be shared. Mr. Schultz. Would it be possible for the residence group to poll internally with the other residents on the street and, and let us know? Do you want to just share it equally? Do you, I mean, give us, we really can't go further, much further on this until you guys tell us what you guys, how you want to handle it from those standpoints. Come on up, Rosalie. Sure. Right, come on up.
Hi. Rosalie Cravata, 223 Swan Pond Road. I, um, I, I, at, the, at the meeting, I, I feel that most residents, we had some private conversations afterwards, felt that we'd probably uh, just e equally share. And if there's someone there, you know, let's face it, we know there's one property owner that, you know, doesn't want to pay into anything. So, you know, we would then assume picking up whatever that cost share is. But so much depends on what the cost is going to be. And um, so we left that meeting the other evening with uh, feeling that the town still had to figure out a lot of details. And, and, and the aspect of the town owning anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of the property along, on, along the road area is an important thing to figure out. Um, I, I guess I didn't understand that there was not surveys done, you know, that the town wouldn't know exactly, you know, where the um, end and starting points of those property lines are. But, I mean, we're ready, we have a majority that are clearly ready to move forward, and, but we just need to get these final figures to know what we're dealing with. Um, and, you know, so I think we're just looking to you guys to, um, to help us move forward in, in the best way possible. <laughs> oh, and it, just one last thing. As far as uh, the uh, paving and then having an interrupted section, the section that would be interrupted is, is in one place. So it's not like you're going in to pave, and, you know, then stop 80 feet, then pave another 100 feet, and then skip uh, another 100 feet. It's just this one area. And uh, we, we know just from the way the road is now, where the pavement meets the, the current, current gravel road, uh, the way they paved it, it just meets the same, uh, the gravel at, at the same height. And that gravel is so hard packed that there's really no issue when they pave, it, it, when they, I'm sorry, when they snow plow. It doesn't rip up the current pavement in the area at all. So just for what that's worth. Uh, to Mr. Bauer, uh, the, the part in the middle where we have the one owner doesn't want to uh, be a part of this, this program, we're maintaining that road right now, correct? Yes. So couldn't we just pave it if we wanted to? Well, it's still private property, so I think we'd need we'd need some permission from them to go in and make that level of improvement. I mean, are we sure that's what we're coming by with a grader every spring and taking out the potholes? Right. How's it any different than that? You're maintaining the road. Mm. Maintaining means improving. Yeah. Well, we improve it by grading potholes. Yeah. Why can't we improve it by putting a skim coat down? Uh, just. Yeah, no, I, I, I no. that yes, makes sir. sense, but that'd be. A so I, I think that we could do that. I think that the concern that, that I would have is First, that we would now be doing something above and beyond the, the minimum for maintaining safe public safety access. Yep. I mean, that's what we're doing right now, and there are protections for the town for doing just that level of work. But probably more significantly is we're going to create runoff, and we're going to yep. potentially alter the way the water flows around those properties. And um, you know, having gone through this with uh, you know at least one other location where it can be challenging um, after the fact, I, I, I can't advise the board to do that. I mean, you certainly could decide to do it, but I, yeah. I think the risk is high especially given the topography in that particular area. And I still think we need to have a program because we have a lot of miles of, of dirt roads sure. in this town. We're doing it for one road, we're doing it for everybody. We need to have a program in place that, hey, this is how we're going to handle these types of roads. And it doesn't sound like we have that. So what, just one, I'm sorry, Mr. O'Leary. So, so to me, under this article, I think what we need to do is appropriate a reasonable amount of money just to, to get the information that the Department of Public Works needs. Uh, to finalize and actually figure out where, where the infrastructure is going to be mm -hmm. um, just to move forward. So, I mean, if he needs, you know, $40,000, he needs $40,000, well, hopefully it's less. But to me, that, that sounds high, but because I think we have a lot of the information. But it's, it's, it's $40,000 to survey private parcels. Is, okay. are the, are the, at least the six affected parcels going to contribute to, towards that ex expense? Because again, it, it's easy to say that, but what it is being used for is. I, I have a question how, on the infrastructure, the, the six uh, drainage infrastructure there. Uh, how many of those are, 
you believe are on town owned? It would be difficult for me to say, but we do have the map. Yeah, we do. I, I, is it half of them? Is it? Yeah, I think there was, one of a, them? there was more than a couple there. Yeah. But again, we don't know. Pat, is the survey for meets and bounds or for topography? It would be meets and, meets bounds. and bounds at this point. But we know where the road is. Well, we don't know but where we don't, any know, of the we don't know how much of it is on yours, mine, or this. But if everyone's just sharing the cost, why does it matter? We know who's fronting it. So if you do a, if you did a cost sharing, then you would you still need you still have the issue of where those facilities ultimately end up, whose property they're on, and, and, and whose responsibility. And also, what's the town's share at this point? Because it's somewhere between twenty five and fifty percent. Well, I, I don't. <laughs> we don't know that. Yeah, but I also think this is a private road. Again, we go back to the argument: people bought houses on a private road. No one's a private road. It was factored into the price they paid. Now the town's going to help, and I want to help these people, but I don't. I see this as more of a private investment than a town investment. I mean, I, we're going to contribute something here, but I, there's a lot of we're just appropriating money for something that I don't see is going to happen ever until we can answer the questions of what are the mechanics for how we're going to implement this. To me, we're spending we'd be spending thirty, forty thousand dollars on something that. It's going to stand on a shelf for 10 years. But that's not the plan. No, but that's, <laughs> that's not the plan. But until we have a concrete plan, because if I'm on any other dirt road in this town, I'm saying, why is Swan Pond getting this and we're not? And that's a valid argument. So I, I think we need to have a plan in place of how we deal with any dirt road that people want to improve. Because how many miles of dirt road do we have again? That was a lot. Five miles. Five miles. All right. I mean, we got to be fundamentally fair to everybody who's on a dirt road. And that we don't have a plan in place to deal with this. I don't think it should be ad hoc based on each road. How many engineers does it take to get the, uh, the PowerPoint to come up? <laughs> but the, the, the feasibility study two. showed you you need about six, I guess, drainage facilities along the road once it, at least that told you that. That's so right. you know that it's needed and in order to figure out the cost the total cost you're factoring in the cost of constructing those and also the cost of uh, are we acquiring that portion of the parcel by easement paying for it I mean all of these things have to be considered in terms of the final cost factor to the town not just to the residents but to the town like how does the town own a part of the road and there's never any fee given to the town no, this, the, the town doesn't own the road, though, Mr. What's Schultz. What's yeah, No, there, Steve's no, saying it is. It's a, no, it's a, private, it's a private way the whole way. We're just maintaining it because we have a, we're maintaining it for public safety vehicle access. Well, Mr. O'Leary's indicated the town has an ownership interest. Not 50 percent of, 25 to 50 percent of the frontage on this road fronts town owned land. Oh, uh, portions of the. Oh, okay, that's where you got it. Yeah. Yeah. But the town's not. That's not, the not the where the drainage. It's, it's in the PDF. It's in the PDF. Improve this. No, but the town. I mean, the town's been maintaining this for years, and I would probably have to what three or four times a year grading this thing, and you know, we're following it every store. We're grading it three, four, yeah. five times a year. We're expending, I don't know, three, six thousand dollars a year to maintain this private. No, no, something should be done here. You know, so it's you know, there's a I don't there's a return on a cost of the, of the investment too. Yeah. If we look at it, so it's and again, and it just so happens that the town has frontage on fifty percent of this road. 50? 25 to 50 percent of the 50 road. 50 or 25. So, I don't know. That's what we're trying to find out. I'm going to take it from the presentation that we can't locate the drainage portions on our town owned land. Well, no, it is. It's based on the topography. So the, the topography dictates where those drainage facilities go. And you can see at the top there where those property lines jet out into the water. I mean, that's the level of accuracy we have on, on the property line shown on our GIS. So that's why, you know, it's a pretty significant swing. So we, it's very, very difficult for us to make a determination. That's high tide. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so there are, which of those facilities, John, are on the town on property? It's the one right at the bottom. There. Good evening, John Klipfeld, town engineer. <laughs> so, so part of the issue is that we haven't done any soil testing there either, so we don't know exactly the size and type of facilities that we're going to need. Uh, we've located them. If you see these small blue arrows, uh, that's the way, this is right here is a high point, and the water runs down this way and then down this way at that location. So this would be the low point, which would be the the typical spot for um, some sort of uh, biofiltration or infiltration basin type structure. 
the dark red lines are curbs that we would build to hold the water on the street until it got into there. So you can see there's, there's one location here, another location here, another one here, another one up here, um, which is the same as that one right there. And then you'd need uh, some sort of drainage through oh, there yeah, without falls into the wetlands. And then there'd be more outfalls in here. But as far as the structures themselves that you're talking about here, those are generally, we tried to place them as much as possible on town property that we know of. Okay. Um, but you're forced in some locations uh, where there's no town property anywhere near there where we'd have to put one on a private piece of property. So, was it, so it shows this one's on town property, this one's on, so it looks like right now there's two possible locations that would be on private property. So really those would be the only two that would need to be surveyed and I'm not even sure why would you survey those if there be they're not anywhere near the where the parcel is I mean the the, the, the building is but I'm Mr. Schultz yeah answer to that Mr. later Mr. Provada, Schultz. what is just so I want to make sure we expectations are are known by us what did the residents expect for a percentage split assuming the town is got a number of lots and they're gonna if they have five lots they'll pay five numerator and the denominator whatever what did, what are the residents looking for as far as what are they willing to spend percentage wise versus what the town's willing to spend well, I, I assume if we went on the you know the informal 50 50 split that the town has done with other uh, private gravel roads okay we is, you, is, uh, can you just come to him i'm sorry to make i know we're asking you direct there's one right here Ms. Corot, you, as a spokesperson yeah. but yeah. no one can hear you butt us in the room, right. and you're very soft-spoken. So <laughs> it's very soothing, but we need to be here. Um, so, so I guess we were anticipating being eligible for the 50-50 cost split, and so that would mean, in the way it worked in the past, and uh, the precedent has been set many times over, over the last 20 years, is the town would pay uh, so there'd be a 50-50 cost split, and the town pays for all the prep work, uh, the survey work, and then the cost split is with the residents 50-50 with the paving cost. So the town's going to pay 85% of the cost then, because if they have a, a good percentage of the lots that are town owned, mm -hmm. okay, they're going to pay 100% on those. And they're doing all the prep work and all the site work, and then, I mean, the residents got to pay more than that to well, make this work. You yeah. know, we, this, yeah. I, I suppose people can negotiate, but I, I'm just explaining how it's been done in the past. When you say 50 50, are you, um, well, I just want to make sure I'm on the same mathematics here. Mm -hmm. You have a number of lots that are town owned, okay, a number of lots that are privately owned. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at 50 50 on each individual lot of whatever that cost would be? No, that's not what she said. No. Okay. The total cost. Right. The yep. total. Divided by divided. two. Right. Right. Accepting yeah. the, the preparation and mm -hmm. surveying and things like right. that. Right. Which we've already t done that feasibility study on partially. Mm -hmm. But well, what I'm the total. At, no, the total. Let's the, the, a million dollars, which it's going to be more well, than. Well, three hundred thousand. But you know, yeah. all right, three yeah, three hundred thousand, divided in half and. What, what's explained is that they're, they're going to, of the, their share, they're going to cover that equally amongst themselves. Right, but my question is, on the, their share part, are we also including the lots of the town owns? No, that would be... The well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Okay, well then the town's going to end up paying 85% of the project. That's not fair to the town. I mean, I have to, we have to answer all the taxpayers here. So if... if um well, then maybe this is a unique situation. I mean, I, I, I don't know how it's been handled on other, other roads, if there was town-owned, yeah. town but um, anyway, I'm just sharing how I know it's worked in the past. The, in the, in the problem is we want to help you out, obviously. I know, I know. But we're going to have every other dirt road in this town in mm -hmm. here, every town meeting, asking mm -hmm. for the same deal. We're not in the business of paving private roads. Mm -hmm. And we'd be covering under your proposal, not your proposal, but what we're just talking about here. It sounds like 80 to 85 percent of the cost would be borne by the town in totality. So I mean, we got to come up with a better cost sharing arrangement on this 
to have it make sense that I that I could support. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I can understand that, but yeah. but I feel like uh, we can't get to that point until we get through this next stage of just fi figuring out what the actual cost will be. That's fair. Yeah. I, I, you know, that's how yeah. I, I see it. And as far as the drainage. And let me just address that if I may. And I want to. Here's, the problem I have is I don't want to appropriate money to take the next step without knowing what you guys are willing to do. So it's like it works both. I don't want to do, do a study that's going to sit on a shelf here because mm -hmm. it's going to be probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars we're asking for a town meeting. That's you know, mm -hmm. that's that's a part-time paraprofessional in school. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want to make sure that we. We have a better idea. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I'm probably not articulating correctly. Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste the town's money on something that, if you guys are expecting 85% of the cost to be borne by the town, I would never support that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how my board members would feel. Right. Because I don't think it's fair to the other. So that's why I'm saying I want to make sure we're not wasting time and doing something that ultimately is not going to be agreeable to you guys. Sure. Yeah. So that's yeah. all. I, it's mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to be fair about it. Mm -hmm. So, well, like I said, it was always 50-50. It, maybe it's just the survey stuff that gets done and, and some of the other, uh, you know, the, 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 the maintenance on the uh, drainage. I know you, uh, uh, Mr. Bow uh, had indicated that typically the town takes care of drainage areas around town, and that is probably something the town would do yeah. to maintain those. So, um, Again, the problem with the map, though, is the 50 50, mm -hmm. you're 50. A good chunk of that is town owned land. They're going to pay their share of that 50 and the bottom 50. I, that's where I'm struggling with this. Yeah. Can you repeat that again? You said. We do a 50 50. So the 50% is the residents. Yeah. It, just in that chunk, a good portion of that's going to be paid by the town because the town owns some of those parcels. Mm -hmm. All right. They're also going to pay the bottom 50. So what, and the town's paying all the prep work and all the mm -hmm. engineering. Really means the town's going to pay 80 to 85 percent of the project. Okay, uh, and there's another way to look at it that you know maybe the town the 50 50 is done in the way it was done in other roads is the town does all that prep work, yeah. and the 50 50 is split just on the paving portion of it, and then maybe the town then the apostle isn't included right. in that uh, share. This is where I'm not, how many is 13 houses? I believe. Uh, I think it's more like uh, well. Well, let's just say 16 out there, but okay. You know, let's say 16 houses, and they're all pretty much to the northerly side of the road for the most part. Mm -hmm. You have the town owns, I don't know, say seven lots on the south side of the road. Mm -hmm. So does that mean is that 50 percent? That's the residence part. Is that divided by divided by 16 or 23? It's it's well, that's a good question. That's, it, yeah. No, but I it, think Mr. Gilberto can yeah. give us some answers on it. No, you, we're putting you on yeah. the spot, and yeah. you don't have the answers to a lot of this, but you can tell us what the residents want. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Gilberto. So the 50-50 the, the allocation, um, you know, it's been used in other projects, as Ms. Gravata indicated, um, where the town's been able to do a lot of the prep work in-house, and then they hire a contractor to pave. It's also the allocation that's identified in the, uh, the bylaw for street acceptance. So there is sort of a precedent on that 50-50 allocation. You know, sitting here listening to the conversation, when you talk about betterment and you talk about frontage, it, it applies very well when you have a layout and you have traditional one person owns on one side of the street and one person owns on the other. When you look here, and, and let's say that this map is correct, if you look in kind of the left-hand side of the bottom one, Yep, yeah, just that, that map to the right, though. Okay. Those three parcels, arguably three properties there that will now have access to their homes via a paved road, they may not have a betterment to pay at all because it's not on their property. And this guy has double frontage. And, and, and so I, I think it's going to be very tricky for us to try to do it in that fashion. And, and honestly, I, I think to go through a very expensive survey to try to get there, I just am not sure that, I'm not sure that it's going to be worth it for us, honestly. You know, I, I think really... Talking with the director just now and with the town engineer, we know we have a reasonable projection of what the cost is for the project to do it at three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's an upside number, we believe. The estimate was three fifteen. We're, we're trying to allow for a buffer to make sure we we can come in where it needs to be. I think really what we need to decide is what share is the town going to contribute and what share are the property owners going to contribute. If they're okay with allocating it amongst just uh, allocating it by parcel rather than by frontage 
which I think is probably more, it's probably a better resolution than going by frontage because of what's going on with the way the road's laid out. I, I think getting that way, I, I think we can avoid a significant expense in survey to do it. But what it's going to come down to is what is that allocation? Is it going to be 50-50? Is it going to be some other percentage share? Um, I, would I would suggest apportioning it based on how many households are out there, you know, and, and <clears throat> rather than get into the number of lots and confusing it. I mean, th th these are each families that are out there in these homes, eff effectively. They're all going to be imp impacted. They seem to be okay with doing it on a per unit basis. I think we can streamline a lot of this if we were to handle it in, in that fashion. Um, I don't know that we're going to resolve that part of it sitting here this evening. We could go through, try to run the numbers a bit, try to figure out what the allocation would be and what it would be if, say, two people didn't want to contribute, and maybe we can meet again with the residents and try to get a better, some better guidance. Just so I can understand, sure. because this is a bit enlightening. I thought, I thought that it was going to be divvied up. That's what I thought your presentation told us. It would be divvied up, not just by the people in, in whose parcel it's going to run, but everybody that benefits by it. We, we of course, don't, even though we, we own the land. So it, it, we're not accessing our houses. You know, the town isn't accessing any houses or parcels on it. But it's going to be divvied up by everyone, not just the residents in whose parcels it's located, right? Is that what you're t saying? I'm saying if you follow a traditional betterment for street this acceptance we can throw that out this isn't a this isn't sure that at all i guess we'd have to ask the residents that so so but then but i thought what you said was everybody was in agreement that they were all going to contribute equally to the cost of it in including the one particular resident that doesn't want to participate in payment but is that is that part non-participant okay with the rest of you absorbing the cost of at least that parcel. Right. Well, the consensus in, in, in our neighborhood is that that's how it would be done. Y you know, so if there is one person or two people that say, gee, I, I just can't come up with that much, or I can maybe only come up with this smaller portion, then the rest of us will, you know, come together and say, okay, can, you know, let's see, can we add on this extra amount? And we, that's the consensus. Right. We agreed that that's what we would do. Yeah. I mean, I think that's all. That's pretty much. Yeah. That's so you can just including the one who doesn't want to be part of it, right? But right. There's no way we're going to get any money from that person. There's no way you're going to get money, but do you have an agreement with that particular person? Well, well if we forge ahead, we're going to cover your portion of it. That, that's been told, conveyed to that person, yes. But is that person in an agreement with that, I think, is... Um, we need uh, to kind of see that in writing. Uh -huh. yeah, we need well, really need to see that in writing. Well, that, well, well, oh, why, why, why would that matter, though? I mean, well, <laughs> so, Scott had a question. Hold on, I just. Oh, well. Mr. Stinson. At some point. All right. Are you ready for me? Would you? <laughs> just go through a microphone. Uh, just, yep. Yeah, if you don't mind. Mr. Yeah. Gilberto, just a minute, Mr. Gilberto. Good evening. Hello. Scott Stimson, 251 Swan Pond Road. Um, actually, I think you started heading there, but, uh, you know, my suggestion was going to be, you know, a bit of a stalemate among the neighbors is not on our end understanding what our costs might be so that they can get together and say, okay, I'll pay this, I'll pay this, I'll pay this, and sort of raise the funds. If the selectmen tonight could make a commitment uh, to a percentage so that we could understand, okay, we need to repay 75000 or 80000 then I think that would be much easier on this end to find out if they have enough people who are willing to put in and do this or not. And did you so want to be included or not? I know. <laughs> I do not. Okay. I'm at the end of the road and uh, I didn't even uh, uh, sign the release for the survey on my properties. I'm, yep. as far as I'm concerned, outside of this project. But um, th there is precedent for the 50-50 split and the town does own I guess very approximately maybe another portion of land that might raise the town's portion under the traditional betterment to 75 percent or so now I understand that without a precise survey you can't calculate that down to the dollar but I would argue 
you don't need a precise survey to come to an agreement among yourselves since this is, how can I say, uh, uh, not necessarily having to follow the statute of the betterment process because this is a unique sort of situation. If tonight you could agree to a percentage, I'm going to toss out 75% as a possibility, um, then the residents would have a hard number. They could go back and see if they can work it. I don't see how we can sell 75% of the town meeting. I'm not even sure we could agree to a number. Yeah. Not, there's a lot of unknown factors here. So, but it, it, he's not participating, right? But his parcel would be included as. So you would benefit by the payment? Of course, if, well, of course he would. But yeah. so his parcel is included in the parcels that all the parcels along there, right? So no, 19 he's beyond, properties. Beyond. He's beyond. He's yeah, beyond he's the limits beyond. of the payment. He's not going to get hot tub. Right. Are you the only, you're the only one beyond there, right? I'm, I'm beyond the end of this road. Oh, so you here. don't use this road at well, all to get to your house. Road. I would drive on this road. Right, so, so it's benefiting that parcel as well. So that isn't that included in this as one of the 19 so, parcels? So the way that I had figured, there's 19 total properties along the 2,700 linear feet that we'd be paving. This is a dead-end road, so you have to drive through it. There's four of those are town owned, 15 are privately owned properties with 12 separate owners because some property owners own multiple. And then down on the bottom, there's four properties after that 2,700 feet uh, linear feet that would drive over this road to get to their properties, Mr. Stimson being one of them. So in total then, there are, there's the, the total of 19 total properties that includes those four. You're, you're saying 19 above no. the top, including the 19 town. 19 plus the four. But 19, yeah, plus the four at the bottom. So Scott, you're one of four. That's, that's 23. I'm one of 23. That's 23. Of yeah. that's, that's 23 total parcels. Along this dead end road. benefit from this paving. The Correct. This pavement would be the only ingress and egress to their homes. Correct. Only owned by 19 of the property. Right, but I know what you're saying. The other four really are using the road. They're, they're yeah. utilizing the road to get to their parcel. That, you know, might save on the paving cost, but they're still benefiting by the paving. I mean, there has to be a, you know. Well, let's just figure in the denominator. Oh, excuse me, please. Can you come forward? I'm uh, Phil Bravada from uh, 223 Swan Lawn Road. Originally, we just wanted to pave the road. And this, this is how it's always been done. And we wouldn't have separated the town land from our land. We, you know, the, the prep work would have been done by the town. And then when the paving was done, we would pay 50%, and the town would pay 50%. We wouldn't say, oh, the town owns this piece of land, and this is private piece of land. So that was simple. We, we came with a simple request. And now we've got into an ecological, environmental type situation here. The problem I have, I guess, is when I look at the estimate, it doesn't break out the prep work on the road. I understand that, you know, these other the cisterns and things like this, um, I could see where we got to kick in on that. But, but still, I don't see where the town just takes the road does the prep work, and then we split 50-50 on the top. So that's what I think is a little bit confusing. This seems like it should be a lot simpler. Yeah. yeah. It's go back, this is where we are. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying let's go back to the original request. Yeah. But that, so that's where we are. But I mean, if people agree that each property just pays you know, their one portion, I think the town has, I might be wrong, but I think the town has, what, four portions? Yes. Correct. Yeah. And with that, I don't know if that would come out to approximately what the footage, uh, I, I don't know if that's advantageous or disadvantageous to anybody. But so the town would kick in those four, four points. Well, that's my, was my question. And that puts yeah. the, that makes the town pay way too much for the project. Okay. I yeah. think we need to hear from Mr. Gilberto. I'm not sure if we're going to get. I'm trying to get us there. Right. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Gilberto. <laughs> Through you, Madam Chair. So I just, again, speaking with the town engineer and the DPW director. So there are a total of 23 properties that will see some level of improvement in either their property or the access to their property. Not including the town's fault. 
No, including the town school. Including 19, but without the, we, we had four of the 19 and we had four of the 23, because none of ours are beyond the limits of what 19 we're homes about. and four town parcels. Correct. N 19 parcels yep. and, and four town parcels. So I'm just doing the quick math based on what the bylaw says on this. If we own four of the, nine, of the 23 parcels, right? We own 17.4% of the parcels by number of parcels, if you follow me. I'm not talking about frontage, I'm not talking about yeah, acreage. Square footage. Just talking about by number of parcels, which was what I thought I heard the, the neighborhood said was the way they would divvy it up. So if we then multiply that 17% into the 50% that we're talking about the cost share, follow, stay with me now, right? That would equal 8.7%. We add that to the 50% we're talking about. That's the fairest way I can come to us allocating this while factoring the fact, the part, the fact that the town is benefiting this. That would put us at about 58.7% of the cost share. Of the construction. The town's still paying all the prep work and all the... No, I'm talking about that $350,000. Okay. We would so not go know. after the $10,000, but I'm talking about that total of the three hundred and fifty. <clears throat> so our share would be 58.7% of the $350,000. And I think that from a standpoint of, you know, e equity, we have an ability to access our parcels through other parcels that we own and through a road that we own that's on our land. So we don't necessarily have a need to access the parcels, but nonetheless, we will benefit from the access from it, even if we don't have the need right now. So if, if we were trying to come up with a percentage based on that template and the, sh the share that we own, without getting into the whole survey and linear footage and all of that stuff that's going to complicate this, our share would be 58.7%. So that, I mean, if you guys want to take the math back to your neighbors, so you guys are 42% of 350000 and divide that by the number of people we're going to be paying, that gives you a rough idea of what we're dealing with. I don't know that we have a... That's back of the envelope, but that just gives you a rough idea of some numbers. Right. And I, guess and I, and I think... Yep. Which is about 60000 800 bucks for the town, based on three fifty. It's about 15200 bucks per parcel mm -hmm. owner. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you divide it that way... If you divide right. it that way. Yeah. It's 15, We're backing into the same number, I think. Yeah, $15,200. Know, 350000 divided by 23, you know... It, the cost is about $15,200 per parcel. Time out's four parcels, that's $60,800. Know, um, now, if somebody else isn't going to pay, you know, then that $15,200 gets added in and divided by whatever the number is. The remaining pool of residents who are contributing. Yeah. Right. So it's, so if you've got... The that, town's not going to pay twice got, for people who If you've got four pay. people who aren't willing to pay, then all of a sudden you've got that 350 Three hundred fifty divided by nineteen, right? That's eighteen thousand four hundred twenty-one dollars per parcel. Four parcels. That's seventy-three thousand seven hundred dollars for the town. And then the rest of the people have to figure out. Again, their proportionate share. It's all the same between the nineteen. Uh, just to get to the engineering study, that uh, three hundred fifteen thousand. There's things on there that probably <coughs> are, are not really necessary. Uh, the contingency, construction contingency, that $50,000. Um, you know, I thought that there was some of that stuff that really it may not be a factor. You know, that's going to deduct the number. Yeah, the number uh, will reduce. I Again, that's an outside number, and the number will be reduced. Uh, but you're still looking between fifteen and $18,000 per parcel of those that are participating. Mr. Gilberto, I, I, I think we're on the low end because this is, this is going to be public. It has to be bid, right? So we and, have... And that contingency is required in that scenario. That's correct. But I guess, so you are correct. It's going to need to be bid out or we're going to need to buy off of um, our existing contracts for public construction. Oh, okay. The rate The rates will need to be prevailing wage. And I believe you factor that in or the engineers factor that into the estimate. But to address the point... Under the Betterment Bylaw, which we 
I've said it a million times, this is yeah. not that project, but if you were to follow that, we would need to give you a, what I'll call not to exceed number. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing here and giving that number. In reality, our written estimate is $315,000, inclusive of a $50,000 contingency, I believe. So it could be far below that number, but we're required to give the upside number to you under the bylaw, and that's what I'm doing here. Is the money paid up front on this type of an arrangement? I think it better be you get it over time, and we hold it in escrow until the project's done? I think, I think that we could work out the timing of when it's paid prior to us actually getting into the, to, to the paving, <coughs> but... Um, or, or, or the, either that or coming up with a, a, an ability to refund if it, the, the number ends up being less. Yeah. I mean, I think I would think we'll try to work that out somehow. I don't have that answer well, we here. We would money for the residents up front for their share. We would, but we wouldn't. If we took it based on the $350,000 contract and it ended up only being $275,000, we would have some refunds to issue. Yeah. Is, I guess, what I'm saying. So we would be doing all of this and publicly bidding it and constructing the road and it would continue to be a private road. We're not That's accepting correct. it as a public way. That's correct. Because it isn't a betterment scenario. It doesn't correct. fall within the betterment. So in essence also for the board to consider, this is now creating a policy and this is what yes. Andy's, uh, Mr. Schultz's point is mm -hmm. continually ma being made is we now have a policy basically that we're sort of enacting constructively by doing this and this is unusual I'm sure I shouldn't say this but this can't be common to have this type of private roadway is it we well, don't have any aren't other they mostly flat yeah. and straight and you know <laughs> uh, well as far as topography no there are there's some the dirt roads are pretty similar to this most of them are hilly and uh, have quite a bit of runoff um, but as far as the actual layout, this is definitely an outlier in, in the fact that it's bisecting private properties. Most of the other dirt roads in town are just private roads that have a layout. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh. So, uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Barrett, would you be able to get us, I mean, you can use the price per, per foot on this road as a, as a basis, which we know is on the high side, a rough idea based upon how much dirt roads we have in this town, what the total cost would be under this kind of an arrangement? Just so we can have an idea of what we're walking into, because I think every other dirt road resident watching this right now, everybody watches these meetings. You know, the ratings are very high here. So you'd like to see a, a total cost to pave all of the dirt roads? Yeah, I just like to know what we're getting into. Yes, but we are going to get into a situation where I would, I would be very upset if I lived on a dirt road and I saw Swamp Pond got this. So if we're going to be doing this for everybody, let's get an idea of what it would cost. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Walner. Well, I don't think we're. I think people have to, I mean, you've exhibited a lot of effort to get yeah. to this point. Yeah. So people have to be motivated to even come to right. us to look for it. And it sounds like you already have done a few projects in the past where it's 50-50. So this isn't far from that. I don't that. know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I just been hearing that. But it, it, I, I can't imagine there's going to be a rush of people coming to us looking for their dirt to be done. think you'll get some. Mr. Schultz, just. Yeah, no, just. Okay. Mr. Walner, do you have anything else you want to? No, I just, I, I, again, they've exhibited a lot of effort. They're obviously putting up a lot of uh, money to do it. And, uh, uh, you know, if other people want to come forward, you know, I think it is a bit of an ad hoc type thing. So I think each situation is different. I don't actually recall when this first came to us, but it was the result of a citizen petition. Yeah. So Some you remember that? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago. Right. So it was a it was a lot of that that specific yeah, effort and it and it's been moved along because of that effort. Yeah. And if I may, we, we wanna help. It's just you, we gotta make sure we have a procedure in place and know what we're getting potentially getting into. We to be fiscally irresponsible of us to just without having an idea if Every other people want this. What is this going to cost? I'm not feeling that it's big. Of, I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. but I'm not feeling that is is compelling at this point because this has been going on for a long time. They've been motivated, and anybody can come forward and ask for anything. But I just think this is a unique situation. I just think there's just too many variables to say that's our policy. Yeah, and again, to look at the numbers again. If we look at the 315 instead of the 350, and the expectation is the town. You know, 50 percent share. That's 157, 158 thousand dollars. You know, for the town share, including the proportion share of the yeah 50 percent. Uh, you know, but it. You know. 
And, and, and just to add to it, um, it sounds like you were indicating, and I believe as well, is that by paving it for the town, it becomes less expensive for us to maintain it year after year. Well, and so there's a bit of a return on investment. You could invest $150,000 in cash and make the money. I, I don't know what those here. numbers are. Yeah, I don't know I mean, what those numbers are, but my guess is, you know, if you have a continuing annual expense related to maintain the roads, and there's one expense related to not paving it versus another where you do pave it, I, I would want to know that differential, but I do believe there's some return on the investment for doing the work. So we also, the town benefits overall for actually doing the work. I believe that, because I think your grading is, if you're doing it four times a year, yeah. it's yeah. labor, it's... Yeah. It's been a, I mean, it's, it's six or eight thousand dollars a year up there. You know, and this paved road is going to last you 15 years. Mm -hmm. You know, no doubt. Your payback is What's the payback? almost there. Yeah. You know. So uh -huh. I think we can easily overthink this. I don't think we, I mean, and they're willing to put up money for it. It sounds like a reasonable plan, but I've heard so far. Mr. Gilberto, in this scenario, though it's not applicable, but in the scenario of uh, betterment, um, situation does uh, does anyone else have to weigh in and give an approval of that finance or anyone else because um, they're overseeing the road the um, the roadway improvements project so I would assume they would have to do they have a weigh in on it at all okay. in a betterment scenario or is that just moving forward based on what the board allows so I'm not aware of an, another approval process other than the Department of Public Works and the, the select okay. board. I mean, this would clearly um, you know, not be a state chapter 90 project. It's not eligible for it because it's not an accepted roadway. Um, I know I've said previously, you know, it isn't clear where the authority is for the town to do this type of a project, um, but they have occurred in, in the town's history and on a number of different roads. Um, then town meeting is probably the most significant of the approvals that would be required. Um, so that's, that's the best I can, you know, honestly answer the question. Well, for the Mr. Mr. Garata, is there any way you could? I mean, this, again, I know I feel like we're throwing a lot on you guys, but you guys have been really the, the linchpins are getting this thing moving forward. This week, if you could find out two things for us. One, we kind of threw around, a, I think it was a $15,000 number, Steve, was the number we kind of kicked around? No, you know, if, it, if it's going to go by 19 people, and again, the town being four of them, you know, if you're going to include the, the town four parcels, yeah. you know, as, as, parcels. as parcels of participants, as opposed to part of the 50%, you know, say it's 350000 then you, you know, $175,000 is 50%, mm -hmm. plus you've got eighteen five. It's a 58.7 total. Yeah, so, 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 it's more, so, you mean, so the town's share. So how much would each resident pay? Wait a minute. If you I take 350000 which is yep. the high number, divide it by 19, all right, that's $18,400. Mm -hmm. right? That's a straight. Now, 50% of that no. is, is 9200 bucks. All right. Um, it, it, why aren't you adding in the all of the parcels that benefit by this project? Because I'm looking at who's paying. But, but you can't, again, yeah. because you're not going to get any cash out of it. Well, but that's up for the other residents to determine whether they want to subsidize that. Yeah, right. I mean, because if, town benefits, be paying that. If, if we're including ours, we should be including the other four. It should be 23. That's part of that figure. Well, now you're including the four from the town. No, Steve was included. No, Mr. O'Leary was That's fifteen thousand two hundred dollars. All right. If you include all the parcels, they're going to be equally divided. That's the gross amount. Well, fifty percent of the town. But then the other residents. If you're going to say the town's not going to participate as far as paying for those other residents, those other four parcels. Right. Right. But that's what we're saying, which is I think what I'm hearing. So 15,000 times 19 15, is the real number. No, no, no. no that's, 20, no, that's, that's 23. 23. That's 23. 23. gives you 350,000. Talk about for the 50% share. 50% share. Is this 350,000? It's, it's <laughs> 175,000. But it's divided by 19. There's 19 residents that are going to be using this road. So you take the 175 divided by 19. That's $9,200. That's a number that you guys have to determine but, but whether. But then, but what you're saying yep. now, though, 
times. So the change is what you're saying. And it's 92, 9200 times, times 4 plus 175. So that's 211000 $212,000 would be the town's share. Unless you're going to. I don't see how the town should be part of the. Okay. The fraction, so the, as well as paying right, for so half. So that 175 yeah. is going to be divided by 19. 14. Because in actuality, yes. Because in that 19 right. is included four town parcels. I, I still am doing the math differently. But this is basically, if you could find out what the residents are willing to pay, okay, and also if you can find out if the one person in the middle is willing to let us pay, but if you guys pay for it, it's 12,500 bucks. No. Andy. Okay. But it, uh, you you are basing that on the three hundred and fifty thousand. That's the high number. Yeah. This is the outside. I number. thought I thought the outside number was three hundred and fifteen thousand. No, three fifteen is the is. is, is that that's the what the engineer study told us. They're building in an additional cushion. So this is the worst case scenario. All right, three hundred fifty thousand dollars. And if the town is to pay fifty percent of that, okay, the town's going to put up one hundred seventy five thousand bucks. You've got. Four residents up there who are not willing to participate. The rest of the residents, not excluding the town, okay, so that's 14, par 14 parcels up there, okay, are going to split the other 175000 bucks. That comes to $12,500. No. So I just wanted to know. No. Where, where did nope. this other 50000 nope. come from? It's more than that. I tell you what, so, to make it so easier, it, why don't you let us know what, is there on some certain, what the residents are willing to pay. 14 people. And we'll see if it's even feasible. If they're only willing to pay $7,000 a parcel, it's probably not going to get done. So find out what they're willing to pay. Find out if the guy in the yeah, middle the is willing to let the town pave it if someone else pays for it. If you can get that back to us, we'll discuss this at our meeting before town meeting so we can make a recommendation. Okay. But right now. Bottom line is the town's willing to put up, up to $175,000 to get this done. The other 175 has to be paid for by the residents up there, by hook or by crook. How they split it up? How they split it up yeah. is up to them. The town is not, so you've got 23 parcels, four people not willing to participate, and four parcels of the town not going to participate in the other 175,000. All right, so that 175 is going to be divided by 14. So that's $12,500. So it's up to. Somebody doesn't pay, the town pays has to make it up too, like the residents would. We'd have to have the residents share not, before we can start what digging. I'm hearing here. Yeah. You know, that's not what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is the town's willing to put up 50% of the money. I if guess that were the case, it would be it would be less. I guess the bottom line 175 is... 175 would be divided by... If we just know what the actual number is, then we can... 175. So they're telling what they're saying to you is it yeah. could be up to 12500 Right. For the participating. Uh, where, where are you lost, Kate? <laughs> it's $175,000 total. How you guys want to divide it up, it doesn't matter to the town. Yeah. That's the easiest way I can say it. Okay, if I could just clarify something. In the engineering study, they included all the contingency, you know, what could a construction contingency, that would be another 50000 and and some other contingencies. All of that added into the number the high number came to 315000 If the project comes in under, you'll get a rebate. Pro yeah, rata. but you, you were basing your number on 350000 Because you always have to give a contingency when you do construction projects. Let's just ask Mr. Gilberto, please. Yeah. To just, it it could he's be 390000 in the end of, in the, end Again, of the day. Yeah, it could we be more. That, sure. We need, to, we need a commitment. That's what I think is being repetitively said. We don't have... We, we, we have seen you multiple times at this, and we have understood 100% that this is to be done and that the share is 50-50. So the best estimate right now is that 175000 So whoever of the residents is going to be contributing, that's what, what, what we're saying the best estimate could be. Could be when this is all said and done, it's $50,000 more that might need to be contributed half an hour. It would be fifty thousand dollars less. It could, they would be, would be reduced by that. But the figure we're looking at right now, from what the feasibility study has told us, is one hundred seventy-five thousand. What you are asking the town to do is very unusual. That it isn't a betterment. It's very unusual, and that included a lot of this additional work that, including the the feasibility study itself, that the town has already paid for. So. 
it is unusual you're asking us to apply a mold that doesn't apply here and say you pay for all the prep work, you pay for all the ancillaries. I don't think you hear that that is going to be a commitment because I think it's it's a large leap that we're going to have to get this passed to begin with because we already have roadway work underway for public roads here. And so we're now taking funds that perhaps could have been utilized to that for this private project. So I think the, the bottom line is from what we have here, we're looking at $175,000 for whomever the residents are that are going to be contributing. That's the, that's the share that you might go back with to make, make us know that there's a commitment to that at least and that whoever isn't involved is going to be agreeable to that. It sounds like there's four, and that includes the one over which this road goes. So we need we need some sort of confirmation, and we've talked about this before that that particular resident is agreeable to that. Even if that resident doesn't pay for it, even if the other four doesn't get paved over to their road, they're benefiting by it. So we need some sort of agreement that says yes, good, do it. Yeah, w no, we're not going to pay, and we'll let you pay for it, but do it. So we need we need that, and it's more than a consensus. It's it's something I think we would assume we would need in writing to, mm -hmm. to move forward, so that we know we're going to be spending money on something that we're permitted to do without having to go through and any other in, uh, regulatory process. That Madam Chair, can I, can I ask uh, myself and the colleagues here? If they were, if the residents up there, whether it's, and they get the sign outs from everybody, are willing to come up with $175,000, are we willing to support the project at town meeting? I mean, this is what it's coming down to. Yeah. Right? That's a good question. <laughs> well, I mean, that's no, the question. question. That's the question. <laughs> I mean, we're talking here, we're doing a little negotiating, but the bottom line is, you know, the town's willing to put up 50% under a, a betterment that doesn't apply. Okay, which is fine, you know, and I'm, I'm okay with this. Uh, so we're willing to commit up to $175,000. It's really 150, you know, it's up to $157,500 if it's 315, which is really what the engineering study told us. You know, our, our own administration is cushioning it even more, you know. So, but it's really 157,500. But up to $175,000, are we willing to commit to that? Under this article, and move forward and go get your signatures, go get your sign-offs, go get us the easement, and we'll move forward. You know, absent of the easements, you know, the easements and the sign-offs, we're not spending a dime because we can't. So, with those qualifications, I would like to know where we're going to get this money from. What are we taking this money out of to cover this expense? Do you, did you, I don't know if you even got that far, Mr. Gilberto, and I know I'm putting you on the spot. No, I, I thought about it. I'm, that I money think he was asked to figure out a plan. $175,000 <laughs> is a lot of. Well, you got to put up the 350 You know, so it would be temporary bonding, I would assume. And then no, you got to put up, we, we, we can't borrow for it. Can't borrow, okay, borrow, okay, so. No, it's the residents are going to put their 175 up front. There's no. Town's not fronting yeah, 350 here. Yeah. 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 Do we, Madam Chair, to answer the question, uh, I would expect that we would be funding this with uh, available funds, specifically through free cash. I believe that we have sufficient funding in place, but we cannot borrow for it. Um, we cannot use Chapter 90 funding for it. Um, we can't use town road funding because we normally borrow for that funding. Um, so there would need to be uh, free cash. And again, you know, I need to qualify it by saying that. There isn't clear authority to do that, um, but um, but that's the only way I could see we'd be able to proceed with this project. And, and I would see us asking the town meeting to approve the expenditure of up to $350,000 to be reduced by um, contributions from the residents in the amount of 50%. If I may, just to address the issue of the well, time. Just mm -hmm. before we even get to that, mm -hmm. before. What about Mr. Schultz's um, condition that that be prepaid before we even engage in any of this work? Why wouldn't it just be pre now? That's a lot of money. Fifteen thousand dollars is a lot of money yeah. for someone to come up sure. with. It's a big chunk of change. 
but what about because this is a new mold we're creating mm -hmm. here so what, what why wouldn't we not require that and only go to town meeting asking for up to 175,000 why are we covering that we should just get what we would anticipate having to cover and if you know we can't receive the rest of the funds in order to move forward I don't understand why we would ask for 350 that's a policy. It's a new mold, so. th that's a policy decision for the board to make. Right. If this right. were a betterment, they wouldn't pay until the project was completed, and it would be assessed over 20 years. Um, I've talked briefly with the DPW director and the engineer, and I, I think we would want to go through and do the final design, the surveying, and um, some um, for the permitting as well. But before signing on to any construction contracts, we would we would then update the price, the estimate, and expect to be paid the assessment before proceeding at that point. The board wishes to obtain the funding earlier in that process. We would recommend it be the higher number, the three hundred fifty thousand dollars, just to protect the town, to make sure that we weren't holding the responsibility for the balance. In addition, the town would be signing the contracts to get the work done, so that's why we would need all the funds up front and the reimbursement. You know, that when we get the reimbursement and when we sign the contracts, the subject of the negotiation. So we'd have to appropriate all the money, and then we, we wouldn't start the project till we get our share. Our share. Yeah. I mean, it's quite unusual, though. I don't think we would we would have to do anything. I think we're trying to determine no, that right other now. Than, other than you know, we we can't contract for half the project. You know, that's why the money should be in our hands first. Well, that, that, that's fine. From a policy standpoint, we can yeah. we can say that, but we still have to appropriate the entire amount. But we wouldn't be. So what would happen is, is once once the project is completed, you know, we would return the difference, the fifty percent, to free cash. It would, it would convert to free cash because that, just to have excess funds. Why don't we appropriate fifty percent of the project cost? We don't need to appropriate three fifty. That's a policy decision. I, I think that you could do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it will make, um, you know, we certainly wouldn't be able to proceed with much of the work until we had, had right. it in place. I mean, I, I think I, I saw us, again, basing it on the mold that doesn't apply here. <laughs> the, we, we, going through the surveying, the topographical survey, the permitting, and um, the other upfront, the final design, it allows us to give a better estimate and therefore reduce the amount up front that needs to be provided by the residents, perhaps reduce that 175,000. That's the advantage to handling in that fashion. But from, in terms of our appropriation, we could certainly do the 175,000 and say we're not gonna appropriate any more of that. I mean, that's an option, absolutely. Well, I, think, if I, um, I am troubled that we, I don't think this should be an ad hoc decision. I think it's something we need to have a town policy. This is how we're gonna deal with these things. We're gonna have more of these coming down the road. Sure. And, if that's what the policy is, that's fine. But I think we need to have a policy. And, and Pat, if you could just give us a rough, no, not tonight, obviously, but if maybe you could report back to Michael and give him a rough idea of what it would cost if we had to do every road in this town, mm -hmm. just back of the envelope number, sure. just so we know what we're potentially dealing with here. Because yep. we're throwing big numbers around. I noticed what our total road budget is through capital. This would be a good percentage of it. Sure. You know, just for like all the roads we do in town. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a big <laughs> ticket item. Uh, Mr. Gilberto. I, just to, to that point, I mean, this would be at least a third of our total investment yeah. in town roads on, on the average annual investment. For a private road affecting? The 175 or the 350? The 175. For a private road affecting 19 resident houses. I mean, it's, is that fair to the rest of the taxpayers? Actually, it would be lower because we do match it with town road yeah. money. So the share would be more like 25%. But to the question that was asked in terms of the estimated, um, the estimated proportion, if you just did the straight um, proportional allocation this is a half mile of road for a three hundred fifty thousand dollar project 175 thousand of which is going to be paid by the abutters multiply, multiply it by by ten and that's where you're at you know just under 1.2 million dollars I think you end up at yeah. so that, that's just you know the, uh, the end the engineer and the DPW director asked me not to do that math a full disclosure yeah. because okay. the, the variables are, are endless but if you just take this average and apply it town wide that's what you would get yeah so one point two million dollars. This one has nuances; other ones wouldn't. Right. But with that number, I would like to know if it's possible to measure what is the savings the town would experience mm -hmm. every year by having it pay versus not pay. We can do that. Yeah. But if we, with that analysis, if we could look at how much money we're spending, is if we invested that money, 
we can use the interest to to you know repair the roads every year too. So you have to. We can figure that out ourselves. Yeah, but we don't we don't put we don't put our free cash all that in free cash into the bank either again. No, but it sits there. Right, but by doing spending it in big chunks now, it's that much less for it's that much more we're bonding on other projects. So we're spending it elsewhere. I mean, it's being you know it's that much less we can pay for other projects, which means we got to bond more. So we are spending. There's interest costs on these on this money. And just for this road alone, where we have the equivalent of set aside for litigation that we're in on two different cases that we're we're promoting or requesting or asking for. So it isn't a small number. It isn't a small number for one road. I I I do have a hard time answering yes to your question. Well, I mean that's the question yeah. that's before us. Yes. With our yeah. meeting. That's why I want to just put it into perspective here. You know, we're going through all this yeah, discussion. Yeah. You know, the bottom line is, you know, if we're going to buy into this project and we're willing to pay for fifty percent of it, and the other fifty percent is going to be paid by a woman number of residents are going to participate in financing it, never mind who's going to benefit by it, we're going to support it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really what it comes down to right now. But at the end of the you day, know, the voters decide. At the end of the day, the voters decide. But, yeah. but we have to make a recommendation. And, and you know, to me, and whether, again, we're not going to get inundated all at once with every... No. No, we're not. Over time. It's going to trickle in. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, but this and is over what the years and over the years, and again, this is just like the betterment. So you're not going to see any more activity here than you already see because the betterment bylaw is already there, and the betterment bylaw is even better because they get to carry it out over 20 years, mm -hmm. pay for it over 20 years, as opposed to this situation. You know, they've got to come with the money cash they up front. You know, so so as far as you're being inundated by, you know, rec you know it's it's not going to happen. We're not getting the, we're not getting requests right now. Under the betterment bylaw, where we're paying 50% plus all the uh, preparation people, costs, hey, they get to spread it out over 20 years. But when these people realize they don't need to do build a road to code, they can just kind of build a quasi road, I think you're going to get some activity on that. Not, not going to be storming not town hall. Not a 10 or $15,000 a piece, depending upon how many and depending on how long. And that's what I'm concerned that what your so, neighbors are going to want to spend that kind of money. All right, let's. But that's let's, up to them I to decide. Think, that. The question is, are we willing yeah. to, to, support, to support this effort? Uh, a 20 year effort, by the way, or more, you know, a 20 year effort to get this done. Um, or not? You know, and again, oh, yeah. there's a benefit to the town. The town owned lands up there, the town's maintaining it anyway. It's going to be a better situation from a, a, a runoff standpoint because right now the runoff up there is more hazardous than if we put this in and put in the, the requisite uh, drainage. So, from the drinking water standpoint for the town of Danvers, it's a better situation. There was a question on whether or not they would contribute. You can always <laughs> ask. <laughs> I don't know if that you got that far in your review, but it was a that was brought up by the residents whether or not they would participate. I mean, I've spoken to Danvers in the past, and the town engineer over there, I know him. Um, I know that they had a part in pay uh, in paying for uh, the part of Swan Pond that was that was paved earlier. So. This is uh, the GIS map. This pink area right here is actually owned by the town of Danvers. They have a pump station down in the, the lower uh, southeast corner of the lake. And then this pink line goes all the way out to Middleton Pond where they, they draw drinking water out of here into Middleton Pond. So they, they had interest in paving up to this point to access their pump station. Uh, they're honestly not concerned at all about uh, or interested in, at all about paying and for any portion on that side of the road, unfortunately. <laughs> because the paving is what's causing the runoff that has to be addressed through the environmental oh, but actually with, the, with the hard pack that's there now, there's more runoff going into the pond than there would be if we were to mitigate it by putting in this hot top and putting in the, the swales and the infrastructure that's being proposed. It's actually going to enhance the situation from a drinking water standpoint. I think we elect you to call Danvers. Send him a bill. All right. So, but so, do you, why don't we just go through quickly? Because we do have to move along. Yep. I'm not sure if we have firm enough information yet to confirm to us in writing that the residents are going to do this. It sounds like, from a consensus, they are. Um, but, but. Can I just say something? If we were notified, if we were notified sooner. We possibly could have got this all together, but 
you know, we just got it a, a week ago, and it's kind of stick of shock and that stuff going on. Yeah. So I don't know yeah. if that's possible in this short a period of time. Um, the other thing, to, to Mr. Schultz's concern, the reason this is so expensive is because of the reservoir. The other dirt yeah. roads in town, you're not going to have to deal with all. No, this these. road has, has added issues. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, and I guess the the other issue I'd like to address is the one where you hit the dirt and you're going to be digging up your tire. I put in a, a cobblestones in my driveway. My driveway goes down to the dirt road, and I had that concern. So what uh, the contractor did is he put a uh, granite uh, stone in front of the pavers. And so if the plow does it, it hits, the, hits that granite stone. But I don't really think you need to go to that expense because we usually call in before the winter because we want to get a good grading and then when it freezes hard. So as long as you keep that dirt up level, it's going to, you know, the ground freezes, the plow just rides right over it. So I don't see any problem at all jumping this. I, I think it's, we know it's one property that's uh, 80 feet. And actually, this will cut down on the cost, too. And there's another property, which is the one that drives right through it. And I don't know where that stands, but if that, I mean, I'd like to see those folks get it paid because they know they want to. But if that doesn't, I mean, that drops the cost there. And that's probably, you're probably looking at 300 feet less. Um, we measured, we measured the road. We came out with uh, 2,500 feet, 200 feet less than the 27. But, uh, we'll see what you can do, and if we can't, I don't see how we're going to be able to deal with this next week, but as soon as you can, let us know if you can not get a feel of what your neighbors want to do, and we'll keep plugging away at it. Is, is this, this article here, is this separate from the original article to, that we've been passing over? It's the same article. Same yeah, it's amended. It's same, yeah. article. same article. So instead yeah. of so we'll passing over this one, possibly. It's like the next step of the article, kind of. Well, so would you be well no, over? we we moved, we moved, we passed over it so that we could, on our part, get more information through our experts in terms of what could be done, what needs to be done, how could this be done. So that was the purpose of that feasibility study. That and we we agreed we were going to. Uh, I think uh, Mr. O'Leary asked us to put some money for that, which was $10,000 towards that, and just to try to push this forward. So from our part, we've been trying to move it forward to figure it out exactly. But we also know from your part, you've had meetings on this and trying to, to you know, decide what's, what's the consensus. But I also think we would need to have something in writing, I'm assuming, to move, to move our, our case forward or you know ask ask for this to be approved at town meeting i think we would need some firm commitment like that in writing that you know that i mean the, the best meeting we had was the one we had a week ago i think everybody learned something it's to me just a shame it didn't happen in the middle of the summer we would have had more time and i and be on top of it so i you mean i guess I would say that you know, even if we pass over this and we're going to then move on, I would hope that we could get down to it sooner than just a couple of weeks before or the, the June meeting. But uh, that's fair. So I, I think I think what you need is a commitment from this board in this specific case. Yeah. Is that we willing to put up our, up to one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars or not? And again, if, if our policy is going to be, we'll put up 50% of the money, and when they come up with the other 50%, we'll move forward. If they don't, we don't. And it reverts back to free cash. I mean, uh, so whether we, you know, conceptually, if we're in favor of it now without the sign-offs, we know that they're going to go and out there and get all the sign-offs or get enough people to commit to come up with at least a, you know, a maximum of $175,000, we're good to go. But if we're not good to go, yeah, I know. I just, they can't go. I don't think we're uh, just. I'm not. I, I can speak for myself. I can't speak for the other members, and we can certainly poll the members. I don't think we're good to go yet, just with this this information that we have right now. Why is that? Because we we have a lot of uncertain uncertainties here. We have a lot of. We're not even sure if we have a firm commitment here. So. Why would we move forward with something without that? That's my my perspective. 
I don't know what my colleagues. I know how you. No, what, I mean to, to me, I mean they've, they've gotten. I also think we don't have that policy that you're discussing. That, no, that I, but again, perhaps I mean, once these once these other issues, these issues that need to be confirmed or written or some type of a, an arrangement like that, that would also afford us the opportunity to get a policy. And does it is it going to take a month or two months, perhaps? I don't know how long it will take them to get the commitment of everyone on board or at the, the most people on board that are going to cover that expense. I don't know if that's going to take a month, two months, but we should give them the opportunity to do that. I don't think they're going to have an issue with it, but I think that also gives us the opportunity to create a policy. That gives us enough time. We certainly aren't going to not recommend this, but we one way we could address it is to pass it over till the next meeting so that all these loose ends are tied up. I don't know how much that impacts the cost factor or, you know, but how. three fifty, it should be able to absorb the contingencies. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, right. Uh, Mr. Schultz. I could speak for a minute. I, it, I would support this when uh, qualified, yes. I think the board needs to have a policy, how we're going to deal with this and other dirt roads. And I would like to hear from Mr. Bauer just a rough idea what we're looking at the potential exposure to the town with the other dirt roads. That's all. Mr. Walner? Um, I am in support of the 175. I think it makes sense. And it, with all the conditions we talked about, everything has to be straight. But if we did everything straight, you know, we had it all worked out. And I'm not looking at an extended policy. I'm just looking at this particular situation. Okay. I'm in support of it. So that's it then. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's I, enough. I, again, yeah. I'd be in favor of it too. And I, I just don't want to lose another season if yeah. the people are willing to come up with a, you know, with, with the money for next spring. You know, but, we can get town meeting to go along with it. In the meantime, you know, they, they come up with the money and. We've got ourselves covered and we get the easements we need. But again, this is unique. Yeah, we're into October now, and so well, yeah, we're not gonna do anything you're not going to do this next month, right? No. no. I mean, there's a lot of pieces that right, have, the saying. town has to address. But to address. wait until next June, we can't They've go out to created bid. created RFP, everything. Yeah, but you can go out to bid if you pass it next June until mm -hmm. July, right. August, and then you're not going to get it done maybe next fall. Maybe. If not, you're the following spring, the okay. last 18 months. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, you know, so I'm in favor of coming, you know, up, up to $175,000. From free cash? Offices, from with free. contingency that all these things we talked about are yeah. are accomplished or else it's, it doesn't work. Okay. So this is a consensus to move this forward in this meeting? I don't think we, no, not oh, for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think well, we need a board policy on how we deal with these things. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. but I would agree conceptually that if, if, Pack us back a number that, because we are opening ourselves up to people coming in later. It's, again, not going to be a conga line of people coming in, but we need to be consistent with all our residents. And I think that's the key. I think we need to have a board policy, which that wouldn't take long to put together. But I also just, again, want to know from Pat, how long do you think? Hey, Pat, how long do you think you could, it will take you to get us that number? So, We'd have to look at it. John and I were discussing, we had the beta program, which is the, the program we use to develop all of our paving yep. programs. And that's where we have the total length of roadway. So we'll have to look at that. If that has, we can use that length of roadway and use their cost for full depth reclamation because you have to assume a gravel roadway will need to be a full depth reclamation, the most expensive um, application or the most expensive improvement we can do. So we can, we can come up with a, you know, like you said, a back of an envelope uh, estimate on but that. But I do agree with Mr. Pravada that said that we can't really use this as a price per foot because this property Not to, yeah. offers some unique. Part of the issues costs. that you've heard me talk about before is that every dirt road is different. You, you know, you need to determine the right of way, particularly if you end up in a betterment situation. <laughs> so there are, you know, okay. I'd be comfortable with the back of the envelope estimate. Uh, are you going to be able to delineate between people who are eligible for a betterment and people who are in this situation? Yes. With your database? There's a certain length of, well, uh, let me clarify. There's a certain length, there's a certain length of roadways that are dirt and unaccepted, which is a different, obviously a different case. And then there's a certain length that are strictly private. So I can make that determination. I can make that uh, differentiation. Okay, but some of those private ones are not eligible for betterment? Or are they eligible for betterment? That's not up to me. So. The, the betterment is tied to 
whether we're going to accept the street and bring it to town meeting to be accepted. This is it's not possible here without creating zoning nonconformance. It's not possible on traveled way where it's a similar situation, no, zoning nonconformance. There are probably other streets that are like that. Some, many of these gravel roads or dirt roads, there is a layout with an approved subdivision plan or other plan on there that shows one lot on one side and one lot on the other and they own to the middle. And then it's the majority of the lots and we could probably figure out what that cost would be. But again, are we constructing those to the extent that the bylaw calls for where we're engineering them, which we didn't want to do with this particular road because of the cost. Have. If it's going to be a betterment, that's what we would do. Yeah. Or are we improving them in this fashion where they are not intended to be accepted but instead are just improved where there it's a less involved cost? We would need to know that. And with regard to this project, I know we've asked a couple times for, for sign-offs, but the, the biggest obstacle in the sign-offs is the permission to do the work on somebody's property. They may be willing to let somebody else pay for it, but will they let us go on their property? Right in the middle of this entire project. To do the work. So and I don't, that, that I, I think that's a challenge. Yes, yes. But, so, but conceptually, you have heard this. We know you will be at the town meeting. You've, you've been at each one of these. I think conceptually, if all of these moving pieces are in place, actually two of our members already are fully in support of it. I, the other two aren't, so we're not going to get it. We're not going to. So Leanne has to come in and get <laughs> <laughs> in the tiebreaker. Tie not going to. I would say we're going to hold off on the recommendation yeah. on this one, and understanding that by next week, most likely, you're probably not going to have enough um, sign-offs, I guess. But, but, and we're not going to have a policy in place. So. Is that the same thing? The same will pass over. I don't think we've come to that conclusion mm. yet. We've no. remembered it's not even here. No, so. right, yeah. right. But some of these we reserve to take a vote. Um, we have a meeting before the town meeting, and we reserve the vote to that point. But I think it's uh, you're already here verbally explaining that the consensus among the majority of the people on the street is to cover half the portion, and you've given us the explanation of how that's to be apportioned amongst the parcel owners. And I know it seems like we're, 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 you know, we keep going over this and going over this and going over this and going over this, but it isn't something that we've determined in a vacuum. It's a whole host of things that we're considering, as you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I had one question. Yeah. There was, I don't want to mention the person's name, but there was a lady at the last meeting that she has that property where it, it goes down the length of the property. Did, did you guys meet with her? Yeah. So, I mean, that would be kind of key if you can come to a, you know, that's another person that would pay. But if she's not in agreement, I mean, she's attached to the, the other piece of land, so it's, it, both of those pieces of land will be jumped with not, without creating another edge in the top, still two edges. But I, I would ask you to speak with her. It's a nice person. So, Phil, through you, Madam Chair, my guess, if I were a betting man right now, is that we're probably going to pass over this article at town meeting. Probably going to pass over. But I think there, there's a majority here, a consensus, for the board to develop a policy to deal with your situation. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and for the board to develop a, a policy with uh, outlines of guidelines as to what the expectation is of the residents their contributions and how it would, when they would contribute, up to what amount, and then then we could move forward with a policy and you'd have a greater comfort level from a majority of the board, I assume, mm -hmm. uh, to move forward for the June town meeting. I'm willing to go forward you know, yeah. right now because, you know, I think uh, we're not going to have people rushing through the door to do this, first of all. And, and secondly, uh, I can foresee a policy that's going to work, mm -hmm. you know, that we can develop using this as a model. You know, and it's maybe putting the cart before the horse, but I don't see it just letting the horse out of the barn. Uh, it's not gonna happen. I think this is sort of like the uh, Cadillac model compared to other roads. No, no, no doubt, yeah, yeah, no, no, no doubt because of the- Unusual. You, know, you have a unique street. Yeah. You know, yeah. But I think what you have here is a, is, a, is a firm consensus for us to develop a policy to address it. And again, it's not going to be, there's not going to be unanimity, you know, with the Finance Committee, you know, or Capital Planning Committee, and other people who advise this board. 
Uh, but I think there's a willingness on the board's part to establish a policy and then take it on a case-by-case -case basis based upon funding availability to do it. And uh, that puts you in the queue for basically first in line. Number one. Yeah. You know? Number um, one. We've got to be able to sell it to the voters, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's our concern, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but if, if between now and, you know, next Monday night, if you, want to, if you want to call me and say, you know, Steve, I want to move forward on this, you know, I'm okay with moving forward on it, but you run the risk of having this type of discussion at town meeting where people are going to be unsure and say the board doesn't have a firm policy, how are you going to do it, how are you going to handle it. And, you know, and that's okay. I'm willing to run the risk, but uh, a lot of other people impacted here. I, I agree with you, but I, I feel like we also need more information, you know, so I don't feel like you're not gonna, I, we'd be ready. Saying, I don't think you're going to get too much more information. Your range is yeah. going to be between, you know, 9300 bucks and $12,500 to come mm -hmm. up with. And if it's either that's going to work for people or it's not, depending on how many people are going to participate, mm -hmm. and depending what the final costs are. The final cost comes in at, you know, $275,000 instead of three fifty. but your outside costs of exposure you know, it's twelve thousand five hundred dollars. It's going to be more if less people participate. I would even look at it a little bit differently. Look at your total costs. I'm going to say the same thing Steve's saying, but in a different way. Is one seventy five, and as I guess Steve said it before, how you want to divide it up, it doesn't matter to us. And whoever doesn't pay in, everybody gives you permission to do the payment, mm -hmm. even if they don't pay. And across the properties and you know all the rest. Yeah. You know all the side house have to be there. They have to be. So. Yeah. And I, think I think the sign ups you already have. So this leads me to my question: Are we talking about excluding the 80-foot section from being paved, or are we not? No, I'm not. Because we don't have a sign off on that on that stretch. But that's we don't usually do projects with piecemeal. I mean, we, we can't do that. I thought we heard that. So it's not recommended. You, it's not yes. recommended. We can do so it. So is there is the but but is the is it, it unwilling to sign because of not wanting to contribute financially because they've already resolved that. No, it's not the cost. It's just you're it's, not. It's, it's more. It's more fundamental. Okay. Well, <laughs> then this is the problem. This is this is the obstacle for this particular private way. Why so. don't just stop, stop, and stop? We can't pave a private way and have gaps. I mean, it's silly. Funny, it's one oh, gap. Yeah. I got a gap now at the beginning where the pavement ends and the dirt begins. Plow over that. Yeah. We're fine. I mean, this is a quite a pro This is now not only a road project; it's an environmental project. So you have any concerns in that department? You're doing something good for the environment out there. To stop it just because one person, you know, does. Well, I think we spent an hour and a half on this now, or yeah. Yeah. an hour. That means we're here at 11:30 at night when you guys get to go home. So yeah. why don't you guys get back to us what what your neighbors think, and we'll take it from there. Okay. I, and I wouldn't ask for a I wouldn't ask for a vote right now because we do we don't know what the consensus is actually to either you won't get one <laughs> you you may get a consensus to to recommend I think there's a consensus to develop a policy I don't think anyone's against that are they no 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 I'm, I'm no, talking about the water article right now you yeah. get talking about the you water get a two to two right, right, right. Yeah. but these aren't easy decisions to make as you know so okay. it isn't and it isn't easy to decide we're just going to pave over the individual who doesn't want us on their parcel and they have their own right to say don't come on our parcel so, so you're not, not going to pave it you're going to stop and maybe fill in that 80 feet with uh, reprocessed paving loose stuff which is what we do anyway which, which is so what we, they do now you wouldn't be he doesn't want to pave so you wouldn't i'm not saying pave somebody that doesn't want it i'm just saying we stop 80 feet later we start again and finish the project so what we did was a feasibility study, and I don't think that was recommended as a result of that study. We just heard that today. So we just, I mean, a little bit earlier. That's not what you're recommending that we do here. Stop, fill, start up again. Correct. Right now we have one joint. If we did that, we'd have three, essentially, because we'd be stopping, starting, and then stopping, and then there'd be an end, too. 
Um, so not ideal, but not it, impossible. Yeah, it's it's not an ideal situation. Can you show on the map where that would be? Sorry, I just pulled it out. Just so we can physically see that. Sorry, did you extend this one more minute? Now we have an end of pavement right here where the plows will come in and they know where the gravel ends right here. Usually they stake it um, on the side of the road or, and we usually build up a little extra gravel and sometimes it does get damaged but we usually fix it right away. Um, but if we were to stop and start we'd have a, this would be continuous now and then we'd have a line here potentially depending on where we stop and start. Then we'd have a line here where we start back up again. Then at the end, we'd have another stop start. So right now we have one. If we were to stop in the middle, we'd have one, two, three. Thank you. That would cut the road by 300 feet, too. The cost. The cost. Yeah, depending on where you stop and start, yeah. if you cut this little piece out, it's potentially 300 feet of road that you're not paving. It's either 80 or it's 300. Okay. So there's a section right through here, um, and this is the low point. And if you don't pave this, this area here, you can't pave this because all this water goes down towards that location. So if we didn't pave this 80 feet, we'd have to not pave this. This is a very tight area and very steep down to that house. So we, uh, ideally the engineering standpoint would be you'd stop here and then start back up here, which is approximately 250 to 300 feet. Because it would just wash out. Yeah, it, ju it just has to remain the way it is. If you can't, if you can't put this basin in the bottom and pave this area, yep. there's nowhere for that water to go. And this house is, has a very rough uh, yep. lot to begin with. And they already deal currently with a lot of water going through their property. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it, our next, after we still have other articles to review, but what's going to happen in the next uh, agenda is we're going to consider recommendations now. But I would anticipate the motion would be to, to make a recommendation at the town meeting, and then we would further review it at, at our meeting at that point. Because then our other member will be here to, to participate in that and take a vote on that, too. So... Whatever information you can get between now and then, I think is only going to help. Mm -hmm. so. Keeps it going. And it keeps it moving along, right? Yeah. So, okay. Well, thank you for your time, folks. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gilbert. Article 11, appropriating money for inter intergenerational center design. The board at its previous meeting had a discussion. Um, and I believe a consensus to pass over this article, but to make a presentation on the status of the project, which I've done here with the 2014 feasibility study for the Ipswich River Park Community Center, the uh, funding of the facilities master plan, the state facility bond bill, which included language for $10 million for an inter intergenerational community center in the town of North Reading, the 2018 state environmental bond bill with $500,000 for improvements to Ipswich River Park, and the ongoing 2019 facility master plan, um, which uh, for which proposals have been solicited and for which review of those proposals is uh, ongoing. And we are right now projecting to finish that facilities master plan in the spring of 2020. So there's no funding required for this article based on the, the board, my understanding of the board's intention to pass over the article. Any questions? Just that, um, you know, that the, the it, it comes in later, but the location has not been so determined. It kind of looks like it's going to be at Ipswich River. We don't know that now. So. Sure. So I just took the names from the studies that were done previously. When when, Ips, when Parks and Recreation began this initiative with Gale Engineering, they commissioned a study for the title that you see up there. 
then at, at a later point in time, you see what the earmark that was identified by Representative Jones, it's, uh, it does not clearly state a location for it. Um, the Ipswich River Park, um, you know, based on my conversation with Parks and Recreation, that $500,000 could p potentially address work in advance of the construction on that site um, if that was going to be the intention. But clearly, we there's a continuing discussion. And this is just, just a, a design at this point. We're not. This is just an just update to, as yeah. to the status. There's no request for funding tied right. to this at, at yeah. this point. This is all work done previously. I'm, I'm pretty certain we did talk, discuss that location more than once. Uh, in 2018, in, in Parks and Recreation, yes, we did. Right, we did we discuss did. it and did focus in on stakeholders participating in uh, that location and offices and different offices that would be located in a, in a constructed facility at that location. It's elevated since then, though. It's become a, not necessarily a Trevor Park. Location. Where, no. are, where is the other location? Potentially the new downtown area. It's part of the master's the facilities master plan. I don't we think we I haven't like I set on a location yet. We're just no, we haven't set yeah. a location. No. Nowhere's near there. I think this is years away. Anyways, but I'm not. Who, I'm, so in terms of what we discussed before with this board, then how did the uh, when was it? When was a location modified? Uh, location was presented in yeah. July of 2018 by the Parks and Recreation Committee when they reviewed the feasibility study for the Ipswich River Park Community Center, and I believe at that time they were proposing Ipswich River Park as a location. Um, the only other discussion I'm aware of relates to the Facility Master Plan RFP with regard to whether we would consider um, building it in a more centrally located location. It was also, just, just a discussion. Correct. Yeah. And the Council of Aging also director would prefer it in a different location than it's a river park. And that's a major stakeholder in this facility. It's so I don't, I don't want to leave. The Council of Aging is one of many stakeholders that actually well, participated with this one. The, the, in this community center would be uh, youth services, parks and rec, vet services, and Council of Aging Health Affairs. Right. Those would be the primary stakeholders. Right. Those would be the people that would be in the building. That's what an intergenerational community center is. Who participated in that Ipswich River Park location. I'm just wondering what other location does the Council of Aging Director want it at? If, if we, in the, in the strategic master plan, the strategic master plan that CPC did, there is a, there is a designated area in the new, in the potentially new 6228 intersection where we might develop a downtown area that will have mixed use and potentially a theirs there, which one of the things that's been mentioned to go there is an intergenerational community center. We don't own any land there, though. Yeah, the, the facilities it's master it's plan was just a review of yeah. all of our town-owned town town -owned lands. Town-owned facilities. So, any edification you can provide uh, would be a help. Only that after a discussion over this past summer, 2019, um, the consensus was to include references to the town's master plan, and I think that the language in the town's community master plan references potential municipal use in the vicinity of Route 28 and Route 62, that intersection. I don't think it calls out this particular project for this particular building, but it does reference it. So that was the, I guess, the, the compromise language with regard to the RFP going back to the discussion over the summer. If, if, I, mean, I think when we present to the town, though, we have to be, you know, realistic as far as, you know, we own this land here. The other land, we have an acquisition cost. We got to, I don't know, how deep in the weeds are we going to get on giving an update on this? Uh, so this was going to be it? Yeah. <laughs> and then at the, the next slide was um, directly from the presentation that Parks and Recreation made last summer, which is who will benefit, which is, um, these four yeah. constituencies as I well as I don't think we talking about where it's going to be on besides it, you could say I don't know I just no I think if it's a if it's a non-owned parcel and it's going to involve some sort of you know acquisition or eminent domain versus a parcel that we already own and have a structure on that we talked about and all the stakeholders participated in discussion on I think that's a, big, a key to this. 
So whether we have the funding or not, I mean, <laughs> that's a primary. Basically, we want to be shovel ready when the money comes in. That's, well, the, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. And, and initially, I think the thinking was to, to do that here in October town meeting, but with the facilities master plan not having been completed, we're deferring you know, that particular action. Um, well, I, 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 if I may, um, you have three big things going on. You have the facilities master plan, which is looking at all our facilities to try to prioritize them. So that's a big thing that's going on. You have the CPC study, the 10-year study, which has its own agenda of what the town should be doing based on town input. It's, it's not just an absent study. It's a combination of many studies plus recent data. And then you have the sewage. And all three of these are going to land on our plate in six months, nine months, somewhere of that nature. And all of those things have to be considered. And in each of those, we have to, as a board, we have to find a synergistic way to implement things that make sense. Um, and so I don't know what the answer is, but I do know one of the things that does come up is where this intergenerational community center goes. And it's not, in my mind, and by, this, by one of the studies, it's not definite if it's river. And I don't want to leave town residents thinking that's where it's going to go. Because it may not go there. That's, that's a discussion. Fair. I agree with that. Okay, so. That's all I, I'm asking about. I, I simply took the language from previous work. I'm happy to just delete the language that says Ipswich River and then move on from it if well, that no, makes they, the discussion easier. The LUC did a feasible yeah. study for Ipswich River Park. That's a fact. Right. Yeah, so no, why no, I say that. Yeah. Well, these aren't new items. These We've are, been discussing no, these for it's years true. at this point. So it's, um, I've only been here for four years, but we've been talking about this for a long time. It's not just going to come up in six months, but I know there was quite a bit of discussion about that. And so I want to understand. We're not deciding where it's going. I mean, that's, right. that's years off. But facilities master plan was a review of our facilities and our our, our property, so. Yeah. Well, there's been some, talk, some folks want to expand it. I think it should be things we already own now. Right. It's gonna. It would have to come back to us if there's some sort of, you know, different well, our board had parcel directed, for this to be located at. Our board did direct them to look at a few different parcels. Remember that long debate we had probably I don't know, three or four months ago. Yeah, was it? Yeah. Two, yeah. Two, three. Minutes. We definitely. I don't recall directing them to look at a different parcel for this intergenerational facility. I don't recall that at all. We left that. We actually purposely left that out where it would go. We talk about the half round property and the whole area around now. Yeah. Mr. Gilberto. So the direction I received was to re refer to the master plan, which is what yeah. we did in the RFP. Yeah. The master plan includes reference to a municipal facility at the location of Route 28 and Route 62. In a parcel we don't know. <clears throat> it, it, a general concept, and not even necessarily this facility. Okay. So what's the parcel that this would be located at in the master plan? Uh, well, we're utilizing an, master plan as a base. Th th there is an, stop and shop parcels. There's an, a there's an area yeah. drawn around it with multiple parcels that are potential candidates for it. It's basically the stop and shop parcel. Yeah, the old stop. That vicinity. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the vicinity, right? Yeah, that's Not there's a the planner on the spot. That's what her study is doing. I mean, if we ever reached out to the owner and see if they're willing to sell it and what the price would be, I mean, I think if we're talk, keep talking about using that parcel, we should find out what it's going to cost. Yes. We well, let's get our studies done first. Well, no, let's <laughs> find out what the parcel would cost because why? I, study I don't, something I don't even, I, yeah. I think the determination on location and acquisition ultimately comes back to this board anyway. So if we're veering off of what we were originally looking at, for which including that stakeholder, there was participation in that location, I think that should come back anyway to us to decide. So and I, I just may quickly add to that. I think to the public, I think it's important that we I keep hearing, why don't we put on the stoppage our parcel for like a hockey rink, town hall, a fire station, intergenerational center, okay? We don't own it. Okay? We don't know how much it's going to cost to buy it. We don't know if the seller wants to sell it. So I think it's, when you, we send surveys out, would you like a merry go around here? Yeah. Okay, would you like a town center here? Yeah. But let's be realistic as far as when we ask the residents these questions, how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to get it? How are we going to structure the paying for it? I mean. I just think it's it's a little misleading to the public to say, do you want this here? Of course, yeah, I'd like that here, but it's not. It's got to be feasible. And I think sometimes we we throw things out there, and 
<laughs> we got to have a way to pay for them is the most important thing. They're they just, and there already was a feasibility study yeah. on this very point. Now it's years old. So the more we study and add in and let's do this and divert to that, the more we, to use your phrase, are kicking the can down the road. And we're still no closer to the goal in 2019 than we were when we did the feasibility study on this location in 2014. So I think we need to just set the plan, set the focus, keep the focus, gazelle-like focus, so we can get it accomplished instead of veering off deciding maybe we're going to locate it at a parcel we don't even own. Well, let's if explore that, that parcel. Even, if that's I mean, even a decision that's been made. That would be ignoring then what the, the master plan is saying. But let's explore what it would take to get that parcel. But I don't think the master I mean, plan that's is important. saying it locate, locate it there. Because I think that would have been brought to our attention when we were talking about it. It's, it's, so that, um, this goes back to CPC, that CPC has to do a good job of uh, reintroducing what the conclusions of the study was. And I have to tell you, it wasn't a wish list study. It was actually very well thought out, very thorough, and it was driven by citizens um, in a very responsible way. It wasn't an irresponsible, let's build a merry-go-round. I mean, that's just, reckless. I never heard that in my life. I'm not so, against, that was a So it's, but, it, it, but do yeah. we have to figure out how to pay for it? Yes, again, we're gonna be facing the, the, the needs for thinking about how to fund our sewage, which we know in a perfect world, the latest we've heard is six to eight years out in a perfect world. We have to think about how to fund our facilities master plan. And we have to give serious consideration to what the 10-year strategic plan is. At the end of the day, we have to kind of weigh this all out and come up with a strategic, strategic plan that makes sense. But we're not there yet. And we don't have the information in front of us. And it's... Well, let's it's, get the information is what I'm saying. I think it's irresponsible to keep talking about developing the stop and shop parcel. Call them up. Find out what they want to sell it for, if, if they want to sell it. I mean, you got to find out what acquisition costs are. That's the biggest cost of these We're things. just not at that point yet because we don't know know our full numbers, we don't know the studies. Then why are we still, sh no, no, what they're willing to sell the property for, we don't need to study for that, it's a phone call. Are they willing to sell it? I mean, that's, if we keep talking about developing that parcel, let's reach out to them, see if they even want to sell it. That's what I'm, we don't have a master. <laughs> we don't need a master plan to find out what a parcel's worth. It's all right. I mean, it's, okay. Yeah. M Mr. Gilberto <laughs> has his hand up and maybe he can edify us. Um, yes, please. So we, ha we have engaged Stop and Shop to understand, you know, what their circumstance in their situation is. They have a, a, some sort of a, an arrangement at the corporate level with regard to that property where they are not in a position to sell the property until roughly 2025. That's a, a rough ballpark of what they provided to us. This was last year when we made this inquiry to them. Um, we, we did not ask them what their price was at that point in time. We know what the property is assessed at for its value and could probably do an appraisal of it. But um, they have indicated that they are not in a position to be able to sell the property to somebody until 2025, whether somebody's a town or otherwise. Um, they would be open to some sort of a lease to own scenario or some other structure like that. They did indicate that, um, but we didn't get much further than that. So that's, that's the most that I know on it at this point. Thank you. Now you know what I know. And, and this is all discussion on an article that we're passing over to, correct? <laughs> right. But the but thing is, we don't want to mislead the public right. as far as you know, yeah. where the location, that a location has been pinpointed specifically, and we're married to it, because we shouldn't be. We have a lot of other studies being done right now which are going to help guide us in making the best well-informed decisions for the future of this community for generations to come. And it's going to take some investment by this community to do that. And if it takes acquiring some land in order to effectuate the changes that we want to see, if we want to have a downtown, you can't do it without purchasing some land. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to invest. You know, when it comes down to the sewerage, yeah. Eight years in the best case scenario, you know, so you're looking 10, 12, 15 years out before it really gets done. That's irresponsible to throw that number out there. It's, it's not six to eight years. It's six to eight years. Six to eight years doesn't become 15, so we're trying to make an argument. No, it's not a question to make an argument. Well, you, I've been dealing with this thing for years now. You've been to two you, meetings. You heard Mr. Walner, six to eight You've years. You've been to two meetings. You know, so. Yeah, and it's starting to move forward now, isn't yeah, it? Okay. No, no, no. Okay, so the folks, thing is, folks. you know, let's be realistic yeah. about it. Yep. You know, what kind of investment are we going to be making? And is the town going to buy into this whole thing? Steve, you, I can't wait. Right, no, all right. no, 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 I need no, to speak. No, you can't. No, guys. For two years, guys. you have set a certain time frame. Now, when it doesn't fit your argument, it's 15 years. Gentlemen. Be honest yes. to the people, okay. Steve. I said, gentlemen. 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 
this to get please. it done. Please, let's let's. That's not what you said when you were trying to put it gentlemen, through. Gentlemen, that's gentlemen, not true. that's enough. I wasn't trying to okay. get sewage through. I'll check through. the tapes. Go ahead. I was not trying to get right. sewage through. I was looking at the And we have through. pinpointed a property. Right. So we're not married to that property. That's what we should tell the town. A property's been pinpointed, but we're not married to that property. To say a property's not been pinpointed is wrong. All right. We have let's, two studies let's saying move, IRP. Let's move this along. Yes, that, Christ let's Christ move this discussion up. on. This we're passing it over. I, I everybody's made their points. We don't want to pinpoint a property. We have pinpointed a property twice with two studies. Okay. We're and, not married to that property. Yeah, let's yeah, be honest okay. with the people. Okay. All right. Ah. And that that I think is uh, again on an article that we're passing over. I I share the concern and I. And, and I don't want to belabor huh. the point. So let's move, move it along. Article 12, yep. please. Article 12, acquire land for Concord Street and Fordham Road, River Park intersection improvements. These are intersection improvements that are proposed for the area of Concord Street, River Park Drive, and Fordham Road, which would include a crosswalk with a pedestrian phase to facilitate crossing Concord Street between River Park and Fordham Road. Um, to get to the Cummings property, which contains Dunkin' Donuts, Concentra, and other businesses. Amazon, Teradyne, and other companies in River Park, they had approached the planning and engineering departments about adding a crosswalk to allow their employees to cross Concord Street safely. Teradyne hired Vanass, which is an engineering firm, to do a traffic study and design. The work to date has all been at the expense of River Park companies. Teradyne has also indicated that the construction work will be paid for by some combination of River Park companies. In order for this project to proceed, the town would need to take ownership of uh, land in the vicinity of this intersection uh, for, on which the, uh, the crosswalks and the landings would be constructed. Um, the uh, board, I believe, has opted to make a recommendation at town meeting as of this point in time. There was discussion at the last meeting about there being some sort of an agreement, an intersection improvement agreement or otherwise, which I know the town planner has been in touch with town council on. Uh, we do not have that agreement here, nor is it required for this article to go forward. Ultimately, you would need to sign to accept this property after town meeting regardless. So if you were not satisfied with the terms of the agreement, you could decline to sign uh, to accept the land. This is different than what we normally do for accepting improvements to public works on private property. We, uh, we at times have accepted easements, which the, the, the Director of Public Works is authorized with a standing article annually to do. However, in our conversations, um, the, um, the abutting property owners have asked that we uh, accept the property. Um, and it is our understanding at this point in time that they would pay for construction as well, not just the design. And that following that, the maintenance of it would be the town's the responsibility. Towns. The town will be responsible okay. for the, the equipment okay. and for the property on which it's located, absolutely. And so we're, so also the article reads itself that it would be acquired subject to the terms and conditions of the select board. Correct. So that that's how we would ensure the other conditions that we were expecting be met before signing off on it. That's but, correct. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Article 13 is relative to the acquisition and disposition of 70 Concord Street. It's a former industrial property, most recently a dry cleaning um, f uh, facility. Um, property is a location uh, is the location of a historic release of chlorinated volatile organic mm -hmm. compounds or CVOX uh, to the site soil and groundwater. The site, um, the contaminated area, is 70 Concord Street, as well as the adjacent adjacent five and six Hallberg Park areas, and some town-owned parcels that are adjacent to the Ipswich River. 70 Concord Street parcel occupies a, just under two acres of land on the south side of Concord Street, close to the Ipswich River and associated wetlands. Uh, the property is, a de is developed with a single story industrial warehouse style building constructed in 1966, which is currently vacant. Property was home to various manufacturing uses, including adhesive manufacturing, mold release, agent manufacturing. Uh, and bulk dry cleaning chemical uh, retail, which we most recently served as b b before becoming vacant in 1989. The various industrial tenants on the property have caused several releases of oil and or hazardous materials to the subsurface, which have contributed to a plume of groundwater contamination associated with chlorinated solvents. The property taxes and interest owned to the town exceed $500,000. Um, the article here would authorize the select board to acquire and potentially dispose of this parcel. And working with town council and with our tax title attorney, we would do so in a, in a fashion to 
minimize um, uh, any risk with regard to the environmental condition of the parcel. So we would hold the parcel in the town's possession for a very short period of time before selling it off um, through the RFP process. If we did not um, finalize a transaction and actually convey the property, we would have the option to go back to the land court and ask that our foreclosure be vacated so that it would no longer be our property. We return to effectively having no ownership at this point in time, which is where it stands today. Any questions of the members? That's progress. Oh, really, I mean, <laughs> the letter indicates I may have misspoken. How many years? 20. Oh, the 20, 30 years? 20. I don't know. When's the last time it was said? 84. 89. So, okay, 20, 30 years. It's around 30 years. 30. 30. Sorry about Mr. that. Mr. Gilberto. Yes, Madam Chair, I was not paying attention. <laughs> Are you, I don't think there are the any big questions on that one. Okay. <laughs> that one's fresh in our memory, having discussed it more recently. So, All right, Article 14. Article 14, um, amending the code of uh, zoning bylaws, which was put on as a placeholder relative to the proposed project at 20 Elm Street. However, we anticipate passing over this article because we do not have any zoning recommendation at this point in time. Okay. Haven't made much progress. <laughs> passing over that one. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, um, do we have an 830 hearing? We do, yes. <laughs> oh, my word. It's, it's 10 o'clock. Notice of public hearing. I, oh, actually, I it's just a dis, it's a show cause. Yeah. Never mind. It's a show cause. Yeah. All right. We close the public hearing on this other one, right, Madam Chair? Um, I thought it was hearing? just an informational. Oh, information. I'm sorry. Yep. Informational. Uh, I w I'm actually going to skip over the designation till the end, if so we can get just to uh, this show cause and to Reverend Fish's matter. If it's okay, we're going to skip around. We try to stay with the program, but in some cases, it's probably better to skip around. So, um, okay. Our next order of business is a show cause hearing. RSS convenience, doing business as convenience. Plus, we have the licensee here, and we have our chief and um, Amy Lutzkowitz with us here to speak and, and typically how we would hear from the chief to present us the information that we need to consider and then we'll hear from you at the podium. Okay. Go ahead. Thank chief. you, Madam Chair. Um, on Friday, August 30th of this year, I received a report that a clerk at Convenience Plus, um, which is located at 7 Main Street, violated Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, sale or delivery of alcohol beverage to a person under the age of 21. The violation occurred during an alcohol compliance check which was conducted by the North Reading Police Detective Division. As you may be aware, alcohol compliance checks are one of our strategies used to reduce underage alcohol consumption. We conduct these checks several times a year which are done in compliance with the Massachusetts Alcohol Beverage Control Commission guidelines. On that Friday, Detective Tom Hatch and Lieutenant Tom Romeo, with the assistance of a person under the age of 21, visited several liquor license establishments in the town of North Reading. During those visits, the underage person would go, be instructed to go into the liquor license establishments and attempt to purchase alcohol. As part of the ABCC guidelines, the underage person would enter the license establishment, attempt to purchase alcohol, and if asked for identification, state that they did not have one and to leave the premises. At approximately 4.30 that day, a compliance check was conducted at 7 Main Street, Convenience Plus. The underage person was instructed to try and purchase a six pack of Coors Light beer. Approximately 10 minutes later, the underage person came out of Convenience Plus with a six pack of Coors Light. The underage person told our offices that the, there was only one clerk working behind the counter. The officers went inside and spoke to the person behind the counter, later identified as Mr. Rahman. The officers explained why they were there and asked um, if the store owner could respond to the store. Within a few minutes, the store owner, Mr. Mohammed Razik, arrived. The 
The officers explained the reason for their presence and the store clerk, uh, and that the store clerk had sold alcohol to an underage person and that the clerk did not ask for identification. Um, the owner and the clerk were advised of the violation and that a report will be prepared that town administrator to be reviewed by the select board. Does anybody have any questions of the chief? And did you have anything you want to add to our input? All right. So, we'll, if you don't mind coming to the podium, introducing yourself, your name, and you're the licensee. <coughs> We'll have more questions for you. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Mohammed Rajak. I do small convenience business uh, in North Reading last 20 years over there. And uh, I, all I can say, you know, that we are very careful all the time. Last 15, 16 years, nothing happened any time because we are very careful to uh, follow the law. Uh, so uh, he's new, I hired he's new, he's in training. I always try to stay with him. At that time I was uh, going to the Walmart close to the Citizen Bank night drop and I got called right away, you know, two minutes, three minutes, I back to the store. and. Oh, yeah. So only thing I can say, I'm deeply sorry we make mistake. I apologize. I apologize. It does not happen again. We are very, very careful. We will be careful and because we follow the law. And next, next, last 15 years never happened. This is the happen. So I apologize. I'm deeply sorry. Um. Mr. Schultz. I appreciate your candor and your um, your tone that you are apologetic. I was just wondering, has the employee been disciplined internally? Yeah, he's a, he's a new discipline learning. You know, okay. I just go for a few minutes for night drop. That's that yep. has happened. Okay. Uh, but he's very careful. He's learning now. Okay. Very he gets the message. Yeah. And uh, also, you know, the hopefully I'll get uh, one. Uh, macro check, ID check, macro check uh, machine. Hopefully next two weeks I will get that one too. Okay. Anybody else have any, members have any questions? It did, yeah, it did, I think this came up before with the previous people who came in like a month or so ago. Are they up to as standards as far as training? I mean, when you look at there's, I, I don't know if you've even had the chance to investigate that, but is, are they behind the times in looking at people's IDs and how they do that method? Do they have a lot of room for improvement? I don't know if you can answer that question or not. Well, yeah, Amy's here to talk a little bit about what she's been doing um, with Laura as part of our education and prevention efforts. Um, I mean, the compliance checks are done you know, to not, not to catch people, but to actually educate them. So in right. this case, that's what we're trying to do. But um, I really can't comment on how they're how they've done in other days. So I just I, I guess I'm just asking: Is the training and the systems in place for them to do do that job as effectively as possible? Do they have all that right? Am I asking a good question? I don't know. Well, I think you should be asking the licensee yeah, that. He would well, because, because okay, I think I, I think we need to hear that. from him as to what he's put in place as a result of this is obvious violation. So yeah. I think maybe you need to more fully explain what you're doing about this because a machine that checks IDs is as good as nothing if the ID isn't even asked for. And I think that's what this violation's about. So you have, this is your business. This is what you do there. You're, you're, that's what you do, mm -hmm. your yeah. retail store. So uh, what are you doing? Uh, in terms of training and yeah, training it didn't work sitting beside him because you weren't there when he sold this. You had left the store. So yeah. it was at that moment in time that he sold the product without asking for the ID. So having a machine in there isn't going to work. Yeah. So the uh, same thing's going to happen. This, this is we take the, uh, you know, the training is called e-tips. There's a uh, 
inclination mm -hmm. I got this certain which will do for him too. Okay. He's not already yeah. tips trained? Uh, no, he just knew that's why it's, uh, you know, the, he gonna, uh, within, it's take like two weeks to come when we done, so we'll do this one too for him. So he's scheduled to be tips trained? Yeah. Which will, how, how is he then familiarized with what forms of idea are required and any of that, and who, who trained him? Uh, it's called e tips. No, no, he's already working there. So if he wasn't tips trained, how does he know what he's supposed to be doing for the sale of alcohol? Oh, that's a, you know the uh, he just come new. I hired and I planning to do this on at the same time. I'm all the time almost with him in the store. So when you're with him, he's taking IDs. Yeah, always he's taking ID. He basic. Uh, you know, the what have to do, very important for the sale for alcohol. So he all, I teach him everything, you know, the same way I do. He tried to do same way, but somehow, you know, make mistakes, so. Uh, but he's more careful, and I'm planning to train him down to eat tips. Okay. Does that, do any of the other members have any questions? <laughs> I know I'm not a member, but I do have a question, sure. which is, um, when did the when did the clerk who um, who sold to an underage individual when did he start working for you? Oh, he started like uh, three months now. Three months. Okay, so the board has a policy that requires that your employees be trained within 30 days of starting employment. So clearly, he wasn't in compliance with regard to uh, that. That's actually I don't have idea about that. So. Okay, so we, we do notify you when we renew your license each year. Okay. Well, that's a separate violation, then, right? Potentially, the yes. So, I mean, we're actually here on the on the sale. I, I just want the board obviously to know. the yeah. lack of training is could be part of that, or. Maybe the lack of your presence in the store could be the reason for this one, but you know, uh, the kids know where to go, so yeah. you, you know that that's a, that's the thing, and that's what we're trying to avoid. That's why I always uh, stay store with him until he's ready, so that makes you nothing wrong with him. So I just go outside for bank, and then it's happened. <laughs> question. I think I've talked enough about it, but I think maybe we take some, is there anything else, Chief, that you want to add to the discussion? Not to this particular hearing, but I think you'll hear from Amy. You know, we're trying to get all the establishments on the same page as far as, as what the rules are. Even though they, they get something on an annual basis, we're trying to work with them throughout the year. Um, and Amy's going to talk a little bit about that, but I just want to let you know, I, I think, you know, maybe his particular business may not be to the standards of what some other businesses are. and We're trying to get everybody to the highest standard. So uh, I think that was kind of what you were asking. That's what I'm about. kind of, yeah, so it, it seems like there should be a standard, you know, that you embrace, that they know, and that when it comes here, you know, if, they so are, the, if they're educated and they don't. So the problem is, well, ABC, the ABCC sets guidelines and sets rules. Um, you know, it's the effort that's put in by the establishment, um, and then they'll get the results out of it. <coughs> what we're seeing is, is that you know there's always that one time that we just happen to go in and do a compliance check that there's a violation. We're trying to limit that to zero. Right. And and with Amy's program that she's been working on, I think you'll see that there's a lot being done behind the scenes because I think um, Selectman O'Leary had asked us the last time if we're working with you know, the establishments we had been, um, we're just, um, you know, we're trying to bring everybody to the table. So you'll, you'll see a little bit more about that. I just want to let you know, because that's what Thank you were asking. Yeah, that makes sense, it totally makes sense. And I, I, can, I, I can appreciate all the effort you're doing in addition to everything else you're working on, but I think it's really incumbent on you to make sure your staff is trained and that maybe is a massive red flag that the one moment you leave is when the sale takes place. So I, I think that that would be something that, you know, I think 
for I know we we have yet to do our findings and determination, but one of the things I would suggest is that we expect you and, and maybe all licensees at the time of renewal to produce, you know, current certifications for the employees that they've been tips trained or something like that, so that we can see that. But I mean, at least in this case, you should be providing producing that for all everybody. Um, and. It's a little bit of a concern that you didn't even know that was a requirement when it was already provided to you. So, but um, anyway, are we are we having any further dis discussion? You want to do findings of fact or just real quick? Uh, and again, I appreciate you, you admitting to what happened. You're not arguing with us, but you have to. If you have a, a liquor license, you have to know the regulations. If you have to have an employee certified within 30 days, it, it's incumbent on you as the owner to do that. And that's very important, and that's, that is a little disconcerting that you didn't know that. So I would recommend just brushing up on the rules so you know you'll be in compliance. We don't want to see you back here. There's no gray here. It's the law. You yeah. can't sell to minors, and you can't have someone not IDing people who are selling products in your store. It, it's pretty – there's no guesswork there. It's there's, – there's a bright line. It's the law. So, you know. This isn't bread and milk, it's liquor. You know, that's, that we don't want, you know, we don't want kids to learn that that's the place that they can go. And yeah, that's the, you know, the last 15 years never happened. Yeah. We are always careful because it's law, I know it's a law we have to follow, no way we can do nothing about mm -hmm. that. But it is a mistake, we are so careful. I'm so sorry, I apologize and never happened, I could do everything, you know, the law requires I do everything. And the two things you're gonna do is the tips training and the machine for the yeah. IT checker. Machine is coming within okay. next week. All right. Good. Okay. So. And work with them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I keep the going back. things, right. I keep yes, going back yes, to here. Yes. Work with them. <laughs> um, all right, so I think we can just make, make some Findings, right? Yep. That a, essentially, a sale to a minor occurred at the establishment um, on um, September 3rd? August. August, August 30th. 30th. Sorry, <laughs> I'm looking at the date of the report. August 30th, 2019. It was a sale that um, occurred without the purchaser um, being ID'd. And while the licensee had stepped away, I don't know if there's anything else, that's pretty much it as far as the findings the, I could recommend. The individual was not certified within 30 yeah. days of employment. The individual had not been TIPS trained within 30 days of becoming employed at the establishment. He's a has been at the establishment for three months, you said. Three months he's been working there? That's what he said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to accept your findings of fact. All right. Do we have a motion on the uh, on the findings of fact or on the No, motion? I mean I think we need to. What is our protocol again? Can we be reminded of that? Sure. You you. <laughs> Three days. Three days Mr. Holiday Mr. O'Leary always has to remind us of the protocol. <laughs> Because he has a good memory, so it's three days suspension of the holiday weekend. So do I? Do we have a motion, Madam Chair? I move to suspend for three days the wine and malt beverage license for RSS Convenience DBA Convenience Plus at Main Street on. It will be Columbus Day weekend. I will give you those dates in a second. And that the license license must be delivered to the North Reading Police Department to close the business on. Uh, we'll say Friday. That Friday and picked up at the police station on the following Monday evening. 11, 12, and 13. What's it, Steve? 11, 12, and 13. So it's a, so it, it's especially 12, 13, and 14. So drop it off on the 11th and pick it up on the 14th. Mr. Gilberto has his hand raised. Yeah, just for the board's information, we do have another suspension that's in effect for that weekend at Lucky Mart to make, just so that folks are aware. I think our town will adjust. So there's a motion. Do I second. a second? I have a second by Mr. Walner. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
All those opposed? Four in favor, one absent. And so what the decision that you'll receive in writing will explain, again, what you've just heard, that the li liquor license is suspended for those three days. So you have to turn it in to the uh, police station and then you'll be able to pick it up after that three-day suspension, which is an action that we take when this particular type of scenario occurs in which the board has taken and has followed in other um, similar violations. Okay. Yeah, we, excuse me, Madam Chair. We, we've been very consistent with uh, this type of action when local establishments. It's a three-day suspension for basically a first offense and it's been over 15 years, um, but if it happens again, the suspension, it's kind of progressive, it gets worse <laughs> you know, as, it, as it goes on. So uh, you know, again, I too appreciate your, uh, your candor and your willingness to accept responsibility. Uh, that speaks volumes. I mean, you've been a good local businessman for a long time in town, and it's unfortunate the occurrence that you had here. Um, but nonetheless, the board has been very consistent and has to be very consistent because at times, again, you have a right to appeal it. You know, uh, we have been upheld all the time now uh, we, when appeals have been taking place to the ABCC because of our consistency and our policies and how we've implemented them. So, um, you know, just you know, be diligent, be more diligent, and uh, you know, continue being a good member of the business community. It's unfortunate it occurred, and uh, we do wish you nothing but success, but uh, we have to be consistent in our doling out of uh, uh, penalties associated with the uh, violations. Three days suspension. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. So, the, uh, I have to give the uh, license, license to the police station. It closed business on the 11th. Yes. On the 11th. Which is a Friday. Which is a Friday. So you can sell out. You can you, sell out Friday. No, no yeah. October 11th. October 11th. We'll, we'll be mailing you a letter that says all of this. Okay, but October 11th, okay. we have to close the business, drop it off at the police station, and then the close the business on the 14th, you can pick it up and go back in business on the 15th, just, you know, your beer and wine. From the police station or the police, police station. station? Police station. They're open 24-7. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. 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 Could I leave a Oh, I. <laughs> Were you, you wanted to speak about this particular matter? Not about this. Okay, because I, I, I just want to jump forward to, to hear from Reverend Fisher if we can. No be, problem. You want to come forward, please? We're going to, we're going to move around the agenda so we can allow you to leave at some point. This is so fun. <laughs> we'll <laughs> keep. We'll keep, we'll keep the chief and Amy. <laughs> Speaking of liquor. <laughs> I'm telling you. Really There's four meetings in a row tonight, but I think you guys might have been in meetings longer than I have. Oh. But, <laughs> right? And it's only one. So I know, right? So um, we are on the agenda is a matter for the one-day alcohol license for Aldersgate Church. It's going to be held at St. Teresa's Church Hall. And the date is October 19th, 2019. And if you don't mind just telling a little bit about the event and how you're going to be serving, selling, administering, and policing. Sure, right. Well, uh, this is for our Taste of North Reading uh, Food Pantry Benefit Dinner. It's the eighth year we've done it. Um, and we've never offered alcohol before, um, primarily because we started out in the Methodist Church where you can't have any. I mean, you know, while you're in the building. And then we moved to, uh, to the Hillview for a few years until Mr. Yeva took over and made it less possible for us to do that financially. Um, and so then we partnered up with St. Teresa's and we're thinking that we would maybe be able to serve, we would have done it at the Congregational Church, except you guys don't have it either, no. right? So we thought, oh, St. Teresa's. But then when I asked about um, being able to offer beer or wine there, they said that you couldn't do it if you had anyone under 21 at your event. And we use um, North Reading High School students and our own teenagers to help serve and stuff at that event. Um, and I, I don't want to 
you know, I don't want to give up our kids. So I said, forget it, no alcohol. But then St. Teresa's had a little brainwave over the last, you know, the recent administration. And so I talked to the secretary and Bishop Mark about it, and um, they told us how to proceed. So this is the first time we've done it. Um, we would like to provide beer and wine for our guests. Um, we have two TIP certified people who are just friends of the church. Uh, they're uh, a waiter and a waitress up in Lowell at a restaurant in Lowell um, who've agreed to volunteer to do this. Well, we think we do, I mean, sort of hate to say it, but this event is mostly old people. Uh, so it's like a big band. It's mostly like food pantry board people, which tend to be you know retirees who have time to do food pantry board work, uh, church folks. Um, I would love to see more people my age at it, and I try to invite my friends, but it is an older crowd. Um, but regardless, when they come in, they're registered because they usually do uh, make their donation in advance. They get checked off on a list, and at that point, we can do an ID check, um, and we'll just use hand stamps, we think. Probably the easiest, most you know, cost-effective way to do that so that the people who, the two um, waiters who are working at the bar will be able to know that they're over 21 if there's any question. Um, and we were, went with St. Teresa's guideline, which is five bucks for beer or wine. Um, so again, not having done it before, we just asked how St. Teresa's did their own block party last June, which is where they offered it. And so we're just kind of following their guidance. So just a way to level up the event, hopefully make it a, a nicer evening. That There's um, food from the majority of restaurants in North Reading. They supply a little taste of food and live music and silent auction and raffles. So um, just be nice to offer that beer or wine along with it. Any questions? Sounds good. Do we have a motion? Yeah, Chief, do you have backup for this event? Yeah, it's, it gets pretty crazy. Well, actually, we've never served alcohol before. It might. Before I, before I read the motion. Really almost done by like 8.15 every time, and then, I, then the young people go out. Before I read the motion, can you do a quick 30-second yeah. advertisement for the food pantry fundraising? Yes. Um, so this, this particular fundraiser goes to the general fund of the food pantry, so for operations to buy food. I sit on that board also to buy food from like Greater Boston Food Bank or to provide um, bill assistance. Um, but there is a really big fundraiser going on uh, to give the food pantry a new home yep. um, on the site of the Congregational Church property that I'm very excited about. Um, the plan for that is in 2020, I believe they're doing fundraising, and I think it's like 220 that needs to I be raised. I believe they've already raised over 150000 150, Yeah, it's awesome. So this well community underway. loves support the food pantry, and I'm yeah. so excited about that project. I think it's in conjunction with the 300th anniversary yes. of the Congregational Church as well, which is brilliant way for them to celebrate their anniversary so um, but this our fundraiser will go to the general fund not to the another great cause yes and I, I actually left that up to the food pantry board I said we will raise the money and you can designate it to operations or to your capital you know fundraiser and they said operations so. nice yeah all right madam chair I move to grant a one-day wine and malt beverage license to Aldersgate Church for an event to be held at St. Teresa's Church Hall 63 Winter Street on Saturday, October 19, 2019, between the hours of 6 p.m. and 9 p.m., subject to all regulatory uh, department requirements. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Four in favor, one absent. And there's one thing in the notices, I think, that the, to review your plan with the fire department. I think review your plan of sales with the fire department. I don't know if you've already done that. We haven't. Um, actually, George, who is sitting here, my stunt double, <laughs> um, he's just back from vacation, so he'll okay. be able to. He's, he's just to follow up on that, too. Thank you. All Thanks right. for the reminder. Thanks I hope, uh, reminder. hope we see you there. $25 a person. We love to have you. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you for doing it. All right. So, why don't we why don't we hear from you so that you can leave if you feel like it. You. <laughs> Miss Slutskowitz. Madam Chair, if it's okay, I'll just do a brief introduction. Oh, that's fine. Sure. <laughs> Do we need one? I mean, <laughs> for the um, audience at home who doesn't know who's sitting here. For the thousands watching at home. Go ahead. Well, it was more for the, the proposal than the people, but 
Police Chief Michael Murphy and Amy Luckowitz, our Youth Substance Abuse Grant Coordinator. Did I get that right? Close director. Okay. Director, excuse me, director, thank you. Um, so uh, a couple of months ago, maybe even more, um, Amy and the Chief approached me uh, with regard to an opportunity for um, Amy to, to perhaps assist us in making sure we have compliance with the town's policy on server training. And um, it, it's, uh, I think, a, a great way for us to partner with her in the program, particularly because she is visiting many of the establishments that are licensed to sell alcohol already for other purposes. And so what basically uh, we're looking to do here is to ask um, if we could formalize that arrangement because she's already interacting with them on the issue of their training. And you just saw that happen now, I think, with that gentleman who was on his way out the door um, here. Um, and so I guess maybe if we could just give Amy a, a brief opportunity to describe what you've been doing and what you envisioned, and then we have a motion here for the board to designate Amy as our, um, as our TIPS uh, auditor. Sure. Uh, may I give you some materials? Oh, thank you. So thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks to the board. I, if you can believe it, today starts our fourth year of the Drug Free Communities Grant. Wow. Today. Oh, if, don't blink. I can't believe how fast that happened. That is fast. Um, and before I start, I just want to acknowledge all the volunteers and the department employees that work on this coalition, including uh, Pastor Fisher is on our coalition now. Marcy Bailey is the chair, and she puts an incredible amount of work into that. Tonight, uh, we had three moms sitting at the police station making sure they put their best effort into a training that's coming up for parents on, on how to keep their kids safe from drugs. And the commitment to this from this community has been extreme. I think we started with 12 volunteers. We have past 30 now. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that because that's not um, a small matter and it's a critical piece to our success. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so tonight I'm just focusing on our alcohol reduction strategy. So the first few pages you have there is an overview including our past 30 day use. As you know we track, track that number every year as part of our grant and um, you know in particular I'll draw your attention to the past 30 day use compared to national data. And national data, just for clarification, only happens in grades 8, 10, and 12. So that's why you don't see every number there, um, just odd numbers. And unfortunately, I'm sorry to tell you that our North Reading numbers exceed, for grades 10 and 12, the national uh, consumption rate for those grades. Um, I'm happy to tell you in other areas we've gone down, and we can come back and have a whole separate conversation about that. But this is just really to focus on this. And when those numbers came out, we really did re need to refocus our 12-month action plan on some alcohol reduction strategies. And I know Chief has mentioned um, a few of those to you, but and I'm not going to read them all to you, but I want to highlight the TIPS training specifically. Um, as you heard tonight, so TIPS is required by all new employees who serve alcohol or uh, sell alcohol. Within 30 days of their employment, I myself became TIPS trained just to see what it was like. Um, it's an on I use the online system. There are two avenues to become certified. You can do it online uh, called eTIPS, which is what um, the gentleman referred to as being the training. You can also do it in person. And I got to thinking about this and how we can make it completely easier for vendors, retailers, and business people to become certified. What can, how can I take out any sort of question about this? And we pursued a small grant from Winchester Hospital to help subsidize this. Our goal, as Chief said, is zero violations. Prevention to me, this is not about going into businesses and catching people. It's about preventing them and making sure that they're aware, first of all, that somebody's watching. But second of all, that this is really important to our town. And so um, two weeks ago, prior to my vacation last week, um, Laura Miranda and I completed a face-to-face -face visit with anybody who holds an alcohol license in town. So that include um, beverage package stores as well as restaurants. And I actually just talked to uh, Pastor Fisher about making this offer to her as well as she just got her one-day license. But we provided two, two, two toolkits that are compi um, compiled by the state. So we ordered these from the state and then we added to them. So I'm going to give you these two samples. These are yours to keep, except typically they have my business card in them. I just gave one to uh, that gentleman. And also um, our tips, um, excuse me, our anonymous tip, not to be confused with the e-tips certification. So I'll give these to you. So a couple of things that I want to highlight in there is there's a customized letter for each business. Um, we also visited the Daily Vapor at the time as well. And what it does is talks about a couple of trends. One trend that we've been um, seeing 
in social media as kids using out-of-state IDs that are extremely convincing, um, specifically for some reason they've been coming from Maine, Maine IDs. So we physically told every single uh, license holder about that and suggested to them, even if you have that technology, please don't rely on that. You need, it's up to you to look carefully. I would hate for somebody to say, oh, the, the machine passed the, the test and that if a simple looking at it visually would have made sure that it was flagged. We just heard that a couple weeks ago here. Okay. Well, I think that was a main license. Ah, okay. There you go. So um, we went and told, reminded all of those licensees about that. You'll see in the letter also just, um, you know, the request about asking that if somebody presents an out-of-state license that you request a secondary photo ID. Now this has been quite a conversation piece because they'll say to me, oh, I just asked for a credit card or I asked for their debit card and the name matches and it's fine and that's not good enough. So we provide them a list of recommended secondary forms of identification that include a photo. So these are all prevention techniques. We don't, again, we don't see this as enforcement. We see it as preventing a problem. They were also, this is the thing I'm most excited about, um, including Mr. Ranzik was given this opportunity about two weeks ago. We have a small grant from Winchester Hospital. What we can do is subsidize fully the cost of an online tips training. Great. So there is really no reason for anybody not to have this. Um, so the way it's going to work is the licensee will pay for the $40 for the online class, work out an arrangement with me about providing documentation, and I will reimburse the license holder. Do you give them a test too before you give them reimbursement? Actually, eTips does that. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a test involved in it. Um, so every, I can confidently say everybody has received this because I personally went to all of them. Um, it's a great program, we're pretty excited about it, but I just wanna point out this is one prevention tip where, as you can see on the list, we're doing a whole bunch of things, including some things that involve youth, like the shoulder taps and the uh, sticker shock program. The sticker shock mm -hmm. program's kinda mm -hmm. cool. The, our youth action team will go into liquor stores uh, with the cooperation of the liquor vendors and put these bright yellow stickers on most popular drinks that says, think twice before you buy underage alcohol. Here are the fines and, fines and penalties associated with that. Um, oh, you have a copy of that. Big giant sticker, it's not that size. I did also provide for you an overview of our core uh, survey results that also indicates our vaping use. I thought that might be of interest to you um, as a special timing with what happened last week with uh, Governor Baker's four month ban. That is something we're keeping a close eye on and that's something again we could have a whole other conversation about. I can talk to that. The other two things I wanna highlight are the Communities That Talk event that happens, it's going to happen this Wednesday. It's a panel event at the uh, Performing Arts Center starting at 6.30 to eight o'clock. We're going to have experts, we're going to have um, a mom who lost her daughter to an overdose as well as somebody who is, was in recovery himself and now owns a sober at home. And the last thing is the Guiding Good Choices free parenting cl class that I mentioned those three moms are uh, working on right now to finalize their curriculum. But this is a science-based course for parents to help keep their kids off of drugs and alcohol. Again, free, we're offering free babysitting and free dinner. So trying to remove any obstacles and barriers to getting people in the, in the seats. And I'm happy to tell you with that one, we actually were aiming for 25 registrants, we have 47. We've had to relocate over here actually. Oh, Mr. Mr. Schultz. A, a quick question for you guys. With the recent vaping ban, mm -hmm. um, I know some stores vaping was part of their prod products that they sold. Some stores, it was what they sold. How are the different stores handling it? And uh, I mean, are the stores that pretty much just sold that shutting down, or are they still selling other products, or what's going on there? Okay, I um, I was on vacation last week when it came down, and I okay. do want to acknowledge everybody sending me all the text messages yeah. and the and the hey, did you hear? So today, this afternoon, I visited Daily Vapor with the intent of going around to some other vendors. I didn't get around to doing that, but um, Daily Vapor was completely closed. Okay. The Board of Health did go to each establishment, ask them to remove all the products, which everybody cooperated. Um, other than Daily Vapor, the doors were locked. I think, from according to the tenants and other businesses there, I think they left a couple of weeks ago. Nobody knows why. They just locked the doors and left. The Daily Vapor people? Yeah, so I, I, it, I don't think it has anything to do with the ban. Okay. Because it was prior, it was about two weeks prior to the ban. Okay. So Is that, they're why. the only, like, vapor store we have in town? That's, the, that's their? Well, yeah, specific, yeah. yeah, Yeah, they're the only ones that are allowed to sell flavored products because of their special license. Mm -hmm. okay. 
But um, to Mr. Gobernador's point, I do go around to talk to these businesses on a pretty regular basis, and I report back to Chief Murphy about what those findings are, as well as oftentimes they, they find violations, unfortunately. So I think what we'll be doing is applying these multiple prevention aspects to vaping as well, and yeah. that includes policy changes, which uh, the Board of Health has been extremely supportive on. They've been wonderful partners in this. Um, but I'm happy to tell you that North Reading's been ahead of the state in all of this, in terms of education, in terms of what policies we put into place to protect our kids. And again, I'm all about preventing ki you know, access to kids. What adults do is adults' business, but um, the access has been. And there's just, there are zero long term studies on the effects of vaping. I mean. So, ironically, this has been around for a long time, yeah. but it was around in China. It didn't come here to, for, till about 2007. So, what you call a longevity study might be something else to somebody yeah. else, but. Um, well, like cigarettes, where we have correct. 40 years of studies. Yes. And, yeah. And um, just a really brief piece of information is the two things that reduced conventional smoking are what they call combustible cigarettes in the United States, and this includes North Reading as well, is the um, long-term negative health effects. We know that science-based. And the second thing was taxation. We just made them too expensive for kids. That's not a prohibitive factor for North Reading students, um, but vaping products are not taxed at all. They're not regulated at all. So we don't have either of those protective factors in place here. And a lot of misinformation. And a lot of, oh, well, at least they're not smoking, or at least they're not fill in the blank here. And now we know some other things. Um, you know, there's been over 800 cases as of yesterday, 13 deaths. Um, those were related to a lot to some black market products, which we have confiscated in North Reading. Detective Lucci has, has them. And the name of the one that's very prevalent was? Dank. Dank. Dank, yeah. So I'll tell you, Dank is very popular, but there's actually several other ones. Um, I think I have my notes here somewhere. No, you have, yeah. Um, so dank vape is the most common, but some other ones that we've identified as TKO, Moon Rocks, Off White, and Chronic Carts. Um, I have some in my car that Detective Lucci gave me to bring in to show you if you're interested. Uh, it's called White Owl. These are all black market products that 90%, 99% of them contain up to 90% THC. So what they're finding in these CDC studies is that the majority of uh, victims of this disease have vaped THC in high concentrations. Those others have vaped um, nicotine, with the number one product on that being identified as Juul. No surprise. So uh, THC vaping is the suspected culprit as of right now, but there are some other associated cases with just nicotine. Scary. Such a shame. You know, this, this could have been prevented, I think, but unfortunately, sometimes it takes this for the alarm to get raised, and uh, I'm really happy for the four-month ban, more so because now everybody's talking about it. You know, we've been banging this drum for over four years. Mm -hmm. Mr. O'Leary? Yeah, Amy, I yes. just looking at your, your handout here, and the, the numbers are surprising, disappointing, yeah. concerning. Mm -hmm. um, how many kids participated in the survey? I mean, how, how does this work? And yep. How did your surveys work? Yep, so uh, two years ago we switched to an electronic version through SurveyMonkey, so again, maintaining that 100% anonymity was very key to us. All of the, um, we have it broken down by grade about how many kids take it, so we have a margin of error that's generated from that, and they were all well past, um, you know, high, high participation rates. The one thing we can't factor in for is if any aides, uh, school aides, teacher aides, assist kids in taking it that might need that assistance. Uh, when that's the case, that's a little bit hard, so that's a different margin of error that we're unable to measure but very high participation rate. When you say very high, I mean, I'm just curious. Oh, uh, 96 to 98%. Really? Yeah. Wow. I think our lowest grade was 96, and that was probably the seniors, if I have to remember correctly. They have the option to not take it. They have the option to also start the process and quit whenever they want. There is no, you have to finish it. There is no, um, they can skip questions as well. That's important to um, both Principal LaPret, uh and Principal O'Connell. Yeah. Then as far as the, um, legalization of marijuana, I mean, these kids still aren't eligible to buy it. Correct. But they're getting it. Uh, yes. Is it more prevalent, more readily available, obviously? Y yes, so. It, um, be, it would be, but. Yeah, the availability, but more concerning the black market availability. Because yeah. it's less expensive. Why pay the taxes on it if I can buy it from my friend? Uh, and I can also contaminate it with anything that's going to give you a better, a better high, so you're going to be a repeat customer for me. We're seeing that for sure. The number one source of both vaping devices and marijuana and alcohol is a friend, an older friend. 
usually an older friend with an older sibling over the age of 21. A lot of kids think that marijuana is legal at 18. And that's been a big battle this year for us to say constantly, nope, the age is 21. Did you know that? And there is a limit. You can't just carry around pounds of it. Um, but when it comes to the vaping of marijuana, you know, there is no concentration limit. So California actually has a concentration limit where they say even for them enough is enough. We have, we went by way of Colorado and uh, it's, we have no potency limit. So for example, the CDC, the study is showing that those, those cartridges have around 90% THC potency. Now to put that in comparison, back in the 60s and 70s, the average was 6% max 12% if you wanna put it into comparison. That's scary. And that's uh, it's another factor to your point, Mr. Larry, is that the parents' perception of risk or harm has significantly been affected by this. So parents will say, I used and I'm fine, because right. they think it's the same thing. And the kids' perception of risk or harm was changed with the legalization, because they said, why would our government legalize something if it's harmful? These are questions we get asked daily. Detective right. Leach and I have to answer this all the time. Okay. Yeah. Black market part is the biggest disappointment from my point of view. Mm -hmm. I, I, this just should not be happening <laughs> at all. We, it should be really close in price, and if we have to take away taxes, it really is where it should be, because kids are gonna buy the lowest cost stuff they can get with no controls at all. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of the taxation income was one of the ways they passed this statewide was promising Massachusetts a lot of income from the taxation, which we're just not seeing that level. Yeah. The vaping thing is something we'll continue to keep an eye on. Did we talk about um, Barry Jones? Uh, so today, um, Representative Jones appointed me to the state's vaping commission. Oh, cool. Nice. So I'm very much looking to access that data and what that's going to bring and throwing our input in it, too, at a local level. Good choice for him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And us. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good okay. choice. Would you like a motion, Madam Chair? Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Or? No. So just, just uh, how can we get this out more? The data? Sure. They yeah, sent the it to the parents. Yeah, I, it's pretty I, mean, good. They're pretty I don't have good. any kids in school, so. I'll you know, share it with you. Uh, yeah, I know you should. No, I should <laughs> yeah, but right. it's it, it just. Uh, yeah, I open. And I don't have any grandchildren yet, but you know, but, but for people my age, even you know, it's mm -hmm. it's important that we understand what's actually occurring here. I mean, we read about it on the paper, we see it on the on the news, uh, but here in North Reading, you know, the, again, these numbers are significant. They're staggering. Yeah. And so people think it's the same marijuana that was around 30 years ago. It's, I know, right? So it's. Uh, yeah. It's important that we, uh, again, and I know our community is, we've been investing for, for a long time here, which is great. Uh, but we do, we do, we need to do more. This is, uh, this is disappointing. I can tell you what we've done, if this is helpful. Um, I believe, my, so my, my undergraduate degree is actually in communications. And so I believe in total communication. And by that I mean that we do print media, we do digital media, social media, and all of the above. The transcripts are great about pa uh, publishing everything we send them including an article last week we were on the front page related to our overdose death rate in um, North Reading, overdose and fatal overdose rate, um, which I think is something that people have had questions about for a long time, is it going on here? Related to this particular data, we do have an obligation to present it to the school committee first. That happened about two months ago. Um, typically I come to you and do a presentation, we just didn't schedule that yet. This was, the tips was more, um, to me, urgent. And we will be publishing it more in the transcript, social media. Um, it's already been on social media in bits and pieces. So as opposed to releasing a large report, what we've done is we do um, fast facts. And it'll be something related to, let's say, the CDC. That's a good example. Did you know one in five kids use vaping? In North Reading, it's one in blah, blah, blah. And that's how we've been getting that out. The problem is, too, sometimes between grades, it's a significant variance. So we have to take averages and things like that. And I think that's a bit of a mixed message. So I'm very careful about that. But we'll be doing more and more campaigns related to all of that through social media, patch, transcript, and all forms of media. I would love to do a full presentation here, if you find that interesting or you want the full presentation. Um, it's basically, though, that overview is, a, is, is the highlights. We also included at the school's request um, some information and questions related to sleep and stress and social pressures. So that's not included in the overview, but that's something that I provided to the pause team over at the um, the public schools, Dr. Jaley's team. There's a lot of that. And what's the correlation between those two things? You know, there's a lot of studies around uh, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. I'm sure you've heard of that. And the concept is the more ACEs you had in your life, the more likely you are to um, not be able to resist high risk behaviors, and however you define that. And um, that's something I think we could do better about tracking. 
you know, and that's the best part of having Laura Miranda on our team. When the police are called to an ACE, you know, she's able to respond and help get that kid help much faster than I think they would have otherwise. That's the benefit of the, you know, three approach system in the police department. So we have enforcement, prevention, and treatment all in the same house. So I think Steve raises an interesting question because I've also, since Alex has left high school, I don't get you it. You don't any, get it either. Yeah. I don't get any of your stuff anymore, and that's how I used to always get it. Do, can you actually let people just get on the newsletter who's not part of the school anymore? Uh, you know, however you release reports or anything else. So we like don't that? have a newsletter. I mean, I can certainly not send a you. Not yeah, even I just can... things that you would release to the school. Sure, I can that do that. Could potentially, you know, yeah. people who want to. I mean, I I'd love to stay in touch with mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Done. Yeah. Put me down. You know my in, email address. <laughs> you, present, you made your presentation to the school committee in June, right? I think it was in June, yeah. yeah. Our school committee reporter um, wrote a story about yes. it at the end of the year. You may have missed it. So it came up with four of us. He, he wrote a lengthy article, and I appreciated that. That was very nice. Any other questions, comments? No. no, but Madam Chair, I move to appoint Amy Luckowitz as the server training program auditor for a term to expire December 31, 2019, for three months. Second. Motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Maybe we should make it December 31st, 2030. <laughs> <laughs> okay, motion on the amendment. Do I have a second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mm -hmm. May I ask a clarifying question? So for any violations, um, just to be clear, I'm going to be continuing to offer this TIPS subsidy, but our funding for that all expires the 31st. So just so that you're aware of that, beyond that, I'm not sure I'll be able to offer that subsidy. That's a mini grant from Winchester Hospital. And shall I continue to report to Chief Murphy those violations? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you for everything you Thank do you. for the team. Yeah. Awesome Laura, team. Laura, the Chief, the CIT yeah. team. It's sure. Definitely eye-opening and yep. but it's, but it's helpful. As, and I'm just curious. I, I get uh, I'm reading this. Maybe I wasn't paying attention. But as far you started doing going around to establishments when? I'm sorry, sir. When did you start going around to the establishments for the first, tip stuff? Uh, first week of September. Okay, so what do you what do you? No, I, yeah. What, what did uh, on the this, tips? Well, this has been going on for. You talk about the vaping on the alcohol. Alcohol, right? Because alcohol has been going on since the springtime. Oh, the alcohol okay. compliance is different than the tips offer. Yeah. So we, okay. she's been educating and talking to the to the establishments for probably about six to eight months. Okay. Yeah. And, and how aware of our, are our establishments truly? Pretty good. That's so good. I Obviously, everybody can do a little better. They're getting better now. <laughs> I, I know they're getting better now. There was a big jump when I put that packet in their hands. Oh, that mm -hmm. packet's great. It yeah. was um, a good piece of, I think, professionally developed piece, yes. um, as opposed to just saying, here's my business card. Hey, the, this is what I do. Um, I will say that the number one thing that comes up is, should I get this machine that checks IDs? And my response is always, you certainly should protect yourself in any way you can, but please don't rely on that. Your eyes sometimes beat the machine and um, that concerns me one of the notes I made for myself to do is my next reach out to them is going to be on here are the regulations I know you get them when you renew every year but maybe here's another set of them so if a set comes from you in the renewal process and a set comes from me mid-year again it's all about prevention right not having any violations so one of the notes I made here was to, pr to provide um, regs and maybe a campaign something around check every time one of the concerns I have is that uh, a great example of that is Laura. When we go to, I bring her with me on a lot of vaping checks, and uh, a vendor argued with me and he said, uh, "I check every time." And I said, "You didn't ID her, and she looks well under 30, and she is under 30." And he said, "Oh, that's because I know she comes in with you every time." Okay, well we've bought in here for samples and things, and you didn't check her ID. Now she's over 21, but don't tell me that you check every time because I've had her with me. And so I think my next campaign might be a check every time, even though I might know you, you know, kind of thing. But I think overall, they're very responsive and happy to have the help. They don't want a violation, you know, certainly. Um, so, so far I've been received pretty well, especially with that packet. That was a good face-to-face -face time. Yeah, I will say too, you know, I spent a lot of time with um, the moose. And they said, you know, can I have like all of my staff, can they renew on this grant? And I said, sure, if they're within a year, 
do it on my dime. That's absolutely fine. I'd rather have that continued on than have you have the expense. Do it. So we've had some great conversations. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. We are at, now that we've sufficiently now skipped we around, all I think these articles. Let's, let's discuss the recommended warrant article recommending. I think we can get through this rather quickly. Um, and then I was just going to do a, assign them while we're running through them. Sure. So Article 1, I know... Um, well, we've already done, I think, some of these, haven't we? I know the town administrator said that he doesn't expect any reports, but we normally allow that one. So I was going to have um, Mrs. Gonzalez present Article 1, as well as Article 2, which... I think we wait until town meeting so they can finalize bills. So I don't know if we. So I have, uh, Madam Chair, I move to recommend at town meeting Article Two prior year bills. Okay. Do we already yeah, recommend? We excuse me. We are gonna, yeah, we have. We have these are the ones we have uh, motions for in the packet. I think yeah, we, we already, already did all those. I think we already made a recommendation to. Do we? Yes. Go with me on all of them. We went through. Not on all. We made all the recommendations. We recommended the town recommended meeting. Some, and it's only recommended a lot of them, and yeah. then there was just a it, few. It's that only if we're going to. I have motions for like some of them in here, not all. Two so, of so the ones. The, I the only ones I'm advising the board vote on are the ones where I've highlighted an action. So uh, the first one will be Article Four, where we are both to pass over the article. Well, uh, let let we're going to go through them one at a time. But I think in the clerk's packet, it has a vote on each one of these. No, just on certain so. ones. Oh, yeah. all right. So okay. Article 2, uh, Madam so Chair, I move to recommend a town meeting Article 2. You don't, you don't no, need no, to revote that, no. All right. <laughs> I can toss that. Correct. Right. Are we going to – If you want to, you can, but I don't have a final recommendation this for you. This is so. Gonzalez. I'm going to vote for gonna, I'm going to one, – Articles 1 through 3, I'm going to ask Mrs. Gonzalez to Got handle it. Article 3, where we recommended that one already. Article 4. Um, Mr. Schultz, if you don't mind handling That's Article me. 4. Right. Four through and one. And this is the one that we, if we are considering, um, the TA, the town administrator said we're not, he's not recommending any transfers, and what do we want to do? Do we want to change our recommendation at town meeting to something different? Well, I have a motion here to pass over Article 4. I mean, do we have a motion? Yes, I just made it. Do we have a second? A second. Motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So we will recommend, our recommendation is changed to pass over. Article, so that one will be Mr. Schultz. Article 5 and 6, actually. I was hoping you would handle okay. Mr. Schultz. And Article 5, we said we would recommend a town meeting. <coughs> No, we have and there's none, motion. and there's none as the, and during the presentation, there's none at this time recommended, no transfers recommended, so do we want a motion? Yeah, we have one right here. All right. Madam Chair, I move to pass over Article 5, transfer funds to other post-employment benefits liability trust fund. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. <coughs> Walner. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Four in favor, one absent. Um, article six again for Mr. Schultz to handle. This is to um, fund the health insurance for current employees. We would, do you have a motion on this one? Uh, yeah, what do we want to do here, though? I, I, I would encourage you to vote on Monday night on that one. So, okay. I, Madam Chair, I move to Sorry. recommend at town meeting Article 6, appropriate money to participate in funding arrangement funds. We already, I think, <coughs> have that. We already yeah, did yeah. that. So okay. So, so no anything. action required on Article 6 or 7 this evening. And the reason there isn't for Article 7 is in case any other transfers come up between now and Monday night. All right. 7, 8, and 9, I was hoping Mr. O'Leary would handle. Uh, excuse me. If there's no objection to that, Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> yeah, you gave Andy all the winners. Yeah, you get the fun yeah. one. Yeah, you get <laughs> it. didn't, but I should tell you these were assigned before I knew actually what was happening with them. So. That's fine. Um, all right, so we have <coughs> recommendation to be made at town meeting. Do we need, do we need a, it's actually, a, we have a specific amount a TA? now. Is it the, I mean, the town council? 
the only one? That's the only one that needs a recommendation for tonight. Yeah. Not likely to change between now and next week that there are no. any other items. Oh, All right. Nope. So uh, for our article okay. seven. So actually, for, so for article seven, yes, that may change, and I encourage okay. you not to vote on that one. But for article eight, I think you can vote to pass over that at this point. None at this time, you said, right? So, to so article eight, Madam Chair, I move to pass over article eight, rescind authorization to borrow. Second. A motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Article 9, uh, we have uh, figures designated, $250,000 from free cash. So do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to recommend Article 9 appropriate money for special counsel legal expenses. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Do I give us some certain in the motion? No. No. Um, all, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Article. Articles 10 and 11. I was hoping you would take Mr. Sure. Walner. Yep. Ooh, you get a one too. And this is Swan Pond, <laughs> which we may have to have a second night of town meeting God. on this one. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, That's so Just I a second. <laughs> think we, we, we would wait on this one to, to keep yeah, the recommendation. Until Monday night. Yeah. Let, I See think if they come over with a check. Yeah. Right. Or <laughs> I, obviously we have a, a deciding vote which we don't know until we, we have her present. So, yep. so why don't we keep it at that? Um, article 11 is the Intergenerational Center Design, which we've had some spirited discussion about this evening. And, and um, we are recommending a town meeting. Can we pass it over? I think I believe, I believe you can vote to pass it over. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure sorry. I, 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 I move to I, pass over Article 11, appropriate money for Intergenerational Center Design. Okay, I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. A second by Mr. Walner. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I can't stay weak. Um, uh, and I'm going to take the last three. Sure. And uh, we had originally recommended a town meeting article 12. Any motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to recommend. Article 12, acquire land for Concord Street, Fordham Road, River Park, intersection improvements. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So we'll change that to recommended. Article 13 is acquisition and disposition of 70 Concord Street. We recommended that already. And then Article 14, the zoning bylaws, which I guess we're just going to move to pass over. Correct. We're going to keep it as a placeholder and move to pass over? So yes, yes, we won't. Yeah. We can't meet the statutory requirement at this point. It would have to be a pass over. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I move to pass over Article 14, amend code zoning bylaws. Second. Motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Can we revisit agenda item number 11? Um, because we we got an update on that in the context of the warrant article. Was there anything further, Mr. Gilberto, that you wanted to add to that discussion? Because it was listed as a separate agenda item. That's correct. And more for a discussion to, to again, um, reiterate to the board that um, we are working to develop an agreement, but we do not expect to have one in place before October town meeting. However, as you um, stated during the Warren article hearing, the board does have the opportunity to weigh in on the terms and conditions because it would need to um, sign off on acquiring the, uh, the, the interest in the property at a later point in time. But uh, you will need the authority from town meeting in order to do that. Okay. All right. Any questions? Oh, number 13, water, wastewater update. We also talked about this earlier in the... Yeah, we talked about it earlier. So. Okay. 
Anything else you want to add to that? Nope. <laughs> Okay. Water's wet. 14. <laughs> the point Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for the arbitrator Bruce Frazier in the amount of $1,468. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Number 15. Michael, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, police Department is in the midst of a voluntary reaccreditation through the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission. There are assessors who are expected to be in North Reading beginning October 8th, and I attached a detailed announcement from the police chief. Uh, senior rebate tax work off program books are available at the library, town hall, and Edith O'Leary Senior Center for individuals to sign up for the 2019 2020 program year. Tax rebates earned for this program year will be applied on the first two tax bills of calendar year 2021. A variety of jobs are available in many town departments, including the town hall, the library, senior center, the schools, and other departments as needed. To be eligible for the program, individuals must be 60 <coughs> years old or older, 60 years <coughs> old or older, as of October 1st, 2019, and own their home here in North Reading. Ownership through a beneficial interest in a trust may also qualify depending upon the structure of the trust. I attached for the board a copy of correspondence that I sent to the State Department of Housing and Community Development regarding the 20 Elm Street 40B project, as well as a response from the applicant uh, that was sent to DHCD as well. And finally, as the board knows, the FY 2020 budget called for additional food inspection contracted services. The Board of Health, with the assistance of the Public Safety Director, put out a request for proposals to provide these services. Unfortunately, the only respondent was determined to not be qualified to perform the work. Therefore, based on the recommendation of the Public Safety Director and the Chair of the Board of Health, we intend to adjust the Health Director's work schedule by adding five hours per week to address the workload associated with the new food code. This is a temporary adjustment for this fiscal year and will be revisited. Funding is available in the health department budget as it was set aside for the purpose of the contracted services. So this is something we had done at the end of last fiscal year, had suspended, tried to go through the procurement process without success, um, and then uh, intend to reinstate um, uh, in the next uh, week or two. So just in relation to that, you know, I'm thinking back to last spring, you know, when we get into the septic system mm -hmm. again and the need for additional hours in, in that department. What are we doing? this current fiscal year to address that situation so that people can get inspections and everything on a more timely basis so I, I think that I don't want to speak for the health director for the Board of Health but I, I believe that by carrying this recommendation through the end of the fiscal year we'll be able to account for the um, the, the surge if you will in the septic system work uh, particularly in being able to offer a third day of inspections in the springtime. I mean, my understanding is that we would intend to continue that or resume that. I don't believe that the demand has required a third day mm -hmm. recently, uh, meaning after the surge period of time ended, but uh, I think this would give us the ability to reinstate that. And if, so, if further resources are, are required, then we'll be back asking for them. If needed. Yeah, I just think we need to, uh, uh, hopefully the analysis has been done, you know, so that you know, come March, April, May, people can get the inspections done. Yeah, we believe again, it's recurring every year, so it's just like I, don't know, I haven't heard any complaints from the realtors. You know, so it's, uh, I mean, I convey a lot of property in town, and yeah. I haven't heard it being an issue with closing. I, other towns, it has been an issue, mm -hmm. but I think our guys are pretty on top of things. No, that wasn't the case this spring. Again, I was hearing from contractors, I was hearing from property owners. I didn't yeah. have the conversation with the realtors so much, but yeah, so I wasn't hearing them either. And again, it, it wasn't it was more this year than it was. Past. Smoke search too. I haven't heard any complaints. So. They're pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fire department does a good job. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think we do have a running start on it. But we're certainly um, attuned to it after what happened this yeah. past year, obviously. Um, and we don't, we don't want to. We, we we won't get backed up. We will, you know I think we'll be able to make sure that we're ready going into March when it kicks back up. Of course, the weather's going to make a, a difference too. It, so. it will. Yeah, it will. Uh, and then I'll just would just add my um, my condolences to the family of Martin Fair. Um, I, I worked for Martin. Uh, for, uh, Mark, I worked with Martin for um, roughly a year here in the town hall, and he was certainly a you know very pleasant, mild-mannered, and dedicated employee, having given you know, more than three decades to the town, um, and um, you know he'll be missed. Thank you. And 
I think that uh, thank you Mr. Gilberto any other questions of Mr. Gilberto and then we can move on to any old and new business are we anything else that there is left to be said Mr. O'Leary not for me Mr. Wall good I'm up for 24 hours here I'm <laughs> yeah, I'd like to begin a discussion about <laughs> <laughs> Motion to adjourn. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.